Alright. Hello everyone. Um, so today, well, so as I explained in yesterday's stream, um, I'd been thinking about how to um, make things, um, make it so beginners can participate more in the channel because, um, you know, our normal stream on Wednesday and Sunday work on a game and it's, you know, it's not super crazy advanced, but it's advanced enough that, you know, a beginner may not be able to follow this, especially if you've never seen any code. So, um, what I've come up with is every month we'll do a, uh, beginner series where we'll start like at the very beginning, beginning, um, for beginners. And then we'll do that like for four weeks and then after that, we'll restart. So that way, like every four weeks, you, you can participate in beginner stuff. So if you're not, um, you know, if, if you missed the last one, you can catch up. Or all the videos go to YouTube, so you can also catch up on YouTube. Um, but yeah, and we'll just, and basically, you'll kind of repeat every, every month. That way, um, you know, if you miss out on, because you can always watch the, watch the videos on YouTube from past broadcasts, but you miss out on the interactive part. So if you want to take part in the interactive part, you know, every month we'll do it. Um, this is the first one of those. Um, so at least for this month, it'll be every Thursday. I think we may try out each month trying a different time slot, just so that way, uh, you know, if Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern time doesn't work for you, Maybe, you know, Saturday at noon or something, Eastern time will work better for you. So we'll probably bounce around the beginner course's time each month. That way we can try to, you know, as many people can participate as possible. Um, so yeah, and then um, obviously, you know, you can see my face down in there in the corner uh, for the first time. So I've got some, got my kit set up, i uh, got my webcam, got my... Um, Mic set up my Yeti Blue. Um, hopefully, you guys. Hopefully, the sound quality is better. Um, you know, leave me some comments and feedback, or uh, in chat, Discord, uh, YouTube comments, and let me know how the video quality is for you guys. Um, and yeah, so let's dive on in. Okay, so um, well, so first up, I just want to kind of share my uh, philosophy when it comes to teaching and especially teaching code. Um, if you go to like a college course or even, you know, high school court computer course or something, intro courses, usually how they'll introduce the materials, they'll be like, here is a string. Let me tell you everything about the string for the next hour. Um, I don't really like teaching that way because A, learning about strings for an hour is super boring. Trust me, I had to do it. Um, but B, learning about each piece in, in isolation, you don't get the context for, you know, okay, yeah, I know all about a string, except when do I use it? What do I use it for? So instead, what I like to do is I'll introduce something briefly. I'll chat about it for, you know, maybe 30 seconds, if that, um, you know, just enough to introduce it, but then we'll, we'll make use of it. And then we'll keep making use of things and we'll keep coming back to them and I'll keep talking about them and reiterating as we go along. And that way, you know, you get little short snippets, but then you see how they play. So each thing will kind of build in. So that's basically how we're, we're going to approach everything. I'm going to, you know, introduce something. I'll be like, this is a number. It does blah, blah, blah. And then we'll start using it and we'll keep going, um, you know, and keep doing it that way. So, let me adjust my camera just a tick so you can see my hands flailing about. Although that does mess up with the green screen thing when I go really fast. Okay. Um, so, yeah. So, first up, let's talk about where we're going to write our code. So, um, normally programmers will work in what's called an IDE. Uh, it stands for Integrated Development Environment. This is an IDE right here. Uh, this is my personal preference. Um, it's called WebStorm. It's made by a company called JetBrains. Uh, JetBrains. And so WebStorm is the, the like web and JavaScript flavor of it. They actually have a pretty much version for every language out, every popular language out there. Um, 
And really, you could do different languages and different ones. It's just they're like optimized for that language workflow. Um, so WebStorm's here. Uh, this one does cost money. Um, if you pop over to buy, uh, yeah, it's a little bit pricey. This is per year. Uh, and the nice thing, though, is uh, so there is a like annual price to like continue to get updates. But the nice thing is if you buy it once, even if you don't um, renew, you keep a license at the state that you last paid for forever. So really, you could get this for one twenty nine forever. You would just be stuck on the version it was a year for, from now. But if you are a, uh, oh, and actually do for individual use if you're individual, quite a bit cheaper. Um, but um, if you're a student you or a teacher, uh, you can actually get uh, free licenses. You can just go into here. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of other ones. So open source projects, uh, universities, startups, training courses, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, nonprofit. Um, yeah, I don't know what all of these are, what the conditions are for any of them. But, you know, you might take a look here. And if one of them applies to you, then you can go for it. If you can't get this for free and you don't, uh, you don't want to shell out any money, uh, can't right now. There are plenty of free options too. Um, so for different, um, you know, different languages, different things, but really where you type is, um, you know, it, it doesn't really matter where you type the code. Um, so Adam, I know is really popular. I don't have a ton of experience with Adam, but I know a lot of my uh, colleagues really like Adam. Uh, it's kind of a minimalistic, straightforward one. Another really good one, which I do use, um, I use this one if I'm teach if I'm doing like a whole class, um, you know, I you know like volunteering or something. I'll uh, I'll use this guy because it's completely free, uh, and Adam's free too. I don't remember if I mentioned that. But Visual Studio Code is another free one. Uh, it's again, it's a lightweight one, but it's really nice too. Um, there's Oh, what else is there? Notepad++ is kind of a generic notepad, but I know a lot of people use that for uh, dev. Um, Sublime is another one that's really popular. Um, and all of these last handful were all free, I think. Wait, Sublime has a buy link. Uh, oh, actually, Sublime is not free, sorry. Uh, but yeah, so which one you pick, it's really up to you. Um, you know, you can check it out. For all my streams, I'll be using IntelliJ, or uh, sorry, WebStorm. IntelliJ is kind of the, the group name for all of their different flavors. Um, but I'll be using WebStorm. So, um, yeah. Uh, so let's go ahead and we'll dive on in. I'm sorry, I'm going to scooch my camera back just a bit. Okay. Sorry, I'm sure I'll be fiddling with my webcam throughout this stream, trying to get it just right. Um, okay, so let's start up a new project here. So um, I'm just gonna, so really to start up a new project, regardless which editor you're using, and we're just gonna start up a blank one. I could go new directory, um, or I usually, most of the time, cause I always start blank projects, I just go and make a folder and then open that folder in ID. So we'll do, um, Let's just call it beginner coding. Okay. I'm going to open up a directory. B -b -b open. And that list is old. Sometimes with WebStorm, it doesn't keep update the list automatically. You have to hit the little sync button. There we go. And we'll do this window. Okay. So here we go. Completely blank, empty folder. So uh, to start us off, so we're going to be, for this series, we're going to be using... Um, JavaScript. So JavaScript is a programming language. It's been around for a bit and it kind of got a bad rap because when it first came out, it was kind of, mm, when it first came out like 15 years ago, uh, maybe more, It, but it had kind of a, I don't know, it had, it had kind of a poor reputation because you could write really ugly code in it really easily because it was one that a lot of people would start, um, you know, just kind of hacking stuff together 
and you know not really knowing what they were doing and some really ugly code would come out so it kind of got a bad rap um it first came out you know back when like internet explorer and netscape were still battling it out for king of the internet uh, long before Firefox and Chrome came along and made everything better. Nowadays, though, JavaScript is pretty awesome. Um, you know, the current, the latest, well, the um, the what do I want to say? It's not, not the latest version, but the its most its biggest kind of modernizing incarnation is ECMA Script Six. Um, ECMA Script Six. So. Um, but yeah, so this made things a lot better, and now it evolves really fast, and it's a very fun language to write. And of course, you can still write terrible code in this, but the thing is, you can write terrible code in any programming language. Um, but JavaScript is what powers your web browser, all web browsers. Um, so any like fancy interaction, like me clicking this thing and it popping this up, or even me hitting this tab and it loading that info, all that's powered by JavaScript. And you can even, if you hit inspect element, we can get the developer console open. And, and we can even go and we can kind of sneak a peek at, um, at Google's JavaScript. So this is all JavaScript here. It's been uh, uglified and uh, trend, or, um, obfuscated uh, and crunched up and stuff to make it both harder to steal and or smaller to send. Probably in Google's case, it's more on the harder to send part or hard, uh, easier to send part, making it smaller file size. I don't think they worry too terribly much about obfuscation. Um, but yeah, so it powers everything on your web, on your browser. And we're that's where we're gonna play with it today. There's also Node.js, which lets you run it like directly on your computer without a browser to create um, programs that like tech-based programs to do things. So a lot of back-end systems where, you know, they don't have an interface, they don't have anything you can look at other than text, but they like do all the data crunching and all that behind the scenes work. Um, you know, a lot of those are powered by Node.js. Um, and then there's also, and there's a handful of systems like these. So I'll just highlight one right now, Electron. Um, which actually lets you use JavaScript to build stuff that runs on your computer, just like any other program, just like my Photoshop's running. Uh, so JavaScript's really flexible in that you can use it for the web, you can use it for backend stuff, and you can also use it for desktop apps and mobile apps. You can use PhoneGap to do mobile apps. So it's really flexible, and I think JavaScript's a lot of fun uh, to code in. So I think is a great language to start with. So that's what we're going to be using. Um, so to get started, so as I mentioned, we're going to play around in the, the browser. So, <coughs> excuse me. What we're going to start out with first is we're going to make an HTML file. And we'll do it over here, actually. So I'm going to do new file index.html. When you name a file index.html, and it doesn't matter in this case, but that's like your default file that you go hunt, that is loaded up. So when I go to like uh, google.com, it's actually sending me the index, it's basically sending me this, probably. Um, you can technically change that, but that's what browsers do. If you don't provide a page, like some page, it's going to send this page, but if you don't, it's going to send the HTML file or the index file. It's your, your like default file. So usually we'll name our first file index.html. And then I'm going to put down some code in here. And we're not going to worry too terribly much about the HTML bit. Uh, I'm just going to give us enough to be able to uh, play with our JavaScript stuff. But HTML uses um, tags. So a... Uh, an op or a left angle bracket, which is the same as the less than sign, and a right angle bracket, which is a greater than sign, with a, an element name in between. This is a tag, and they most almost always come in pairs. Um, so we see here it's basically the same tag. It just has this little extra bit uh, slash here. So that's the closing tag. So that means that everything inside of here is inside of this HTML tag. Uh, so each, your doc type kind of tells it what your doc type is. 
Thankfully, these got a lot shorter. Used to, they were, I don't know, somewhere like that, and there was no way you could memorize them, and you'd have to go find them and copy-paste and stuff. Nowadays, for modern stuff, just doc type HTML, and you're golden. Um, and then, so, an HTML then basically contains everything but the doc type. And then head contains all of the stuff that is information about your page, but doesn't actually visibly show on your page. Uh, so here you can include things like links, or we can include title, for example. My first project. So title is what uh, your browser puts up here. Um, and I'll actually open this up in Chrome. So I'm going to right click, open in browser Chrome. And so you can see up here, my first project. So it's things that's not part of my page, but it's extra data about it. And then the body is what actually shows up on the page. So I'm going to put here, and I'm going to use up P, this P tag here. This is uh, stands for paragraph. So it's just a paragraph with text. Um, and you can see it shows up on my page. So well, what we're going to do today, because I want to focus more on JavaScript, I'm going to make a JavaScript file. I'm going to also call this one index.js because, again, usually your first file in your project is index. Um, and then what I'm going to do, I'm going to take this guy out. I'm going to come in here. I'm going to do script. And then I'm going to do type equals module. And then type equals module is a special bit that will let me do um, uh, more modern stuff because it lets me um, use... Uh, ECMA script modules, which we'll get to later. Um, but just know that it, it'll let us use what's called the import tag, basically. Um, and then I'm not going to put anything inside of here, but I'm going to do source equals, and I'm going to point it at my index.js file. So whenever you see a file path with a dot slash there, that means it's a file in the same folder as the file I'm currently in. Um, so dot slash means when Chrome goes to look for it, it's going to be like, OK, I know where this one is. Now I'm going to go look in that same place for this file. If I did dot dot, that would go up one folder or directory. Um, and then, or if I had like cake slash, it would go into the cake directory to look for it. But we're just going to look in the, the main place. So I'm going to load this. This isn't going to show anything on the screen. And actually, I can put this up here um, as well. And it would work just the same because this guy doesn't show anything directly all on its own. Uh, but a lot of time, you want to put this as the very last thing in your body. So like if I had other stuff in here, I'd want it at the very end. Um, that way, by the time it runs, everything else is ready in there and built um, to go. So um, yeah, so we'll stick with that. And then, um, so now what this is going to do, it's going to pull in my JavaScript file and run it. So for now, I'm going to go over here. I'm going to put a console log function. New world. And console.log is basically just going to output anything I put here to my console, which is in the developer tools. So I can get to that by either right click, hit inspect element, or you can do control shift I, or you can do F12, which is easier to remember. Then I'm going to go to my console. And the console is just a place where it's going to print out text. So now if I refresh my page, there we go, hello world. So it pulled it in. And if I go to network, I can see the files being loaded up. So I can see it loaded my index file and it loaded my, uh, my index.html. Then it loaded my index.js. And here's my code for that. I also tried to load up a, fa or it did load up a fav icon. Uh, the fav icon is the icon that shows up here. And it's always called favicon.ico. Uh, and ico is just for... Um, icons basically um, but yeah so I can see hello world there and then and uh, so that so I know my my page is hooked up so now now that we have kind of a, a place to play around let's start talking about some of the code so um, first up let's talk about variables so in all programming languages you have variables um, you know, if you've taken algebra in school, you've probably seen variables. Um, let's pop over to Photoshop and draw. You know, you've probably done something like, you know, y equals 5x plus 2 or, you know, um, you know, a plus b equals c or 
something like that. You know, you've played around with variables, and each of those variables represents a number in math. And programming is very similar, except those variables can represent anything. Um, and in JavaScript, we create those variables with one of two things. Well, technically there's three. There's var, don't use var, very old. Uh, just mention in case you're looking at some really old co code, but don't use it. But just know it kind of works like both of these, except it's terrible. Uh, our main two types are let and const. So these two function pretty much the same way. They both create a variable. And uh, if I set, if I do an equal sign and have some value over here, they'll set that variable equal to um, to this value. So if I have, so right now with this code, a equals five and b equals c. So I can console log those, and I should see five and three. So it just printed out the values of a and b. The difference between const and let is a is allowed to change its value after it's been set. Const isn't. Const is short for constant. People say we should use const by default. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. So, um, yes, you should always default to const unless you need to make it let. Um, that is absolutely a great rule to follow. It's one I follow all the time. Um, because, and the reason for that is, um, if say, so if I have a variable, so first we'll see what it looks like to change the value of a. So here I'm going to change a. So a was set to five and now I'm changing it to three. So now if I console log three, three, cause a was also three now. The reason what the biggest reason, well, not maybe the biggest. One of the best reasons though for using that is sometimes you'll do something like this and you want to check what the value of a is, which you normally would do like this, but I just made a typo here. And if I do this, my code is, my a is accidentally going to change to four because that's what I told it here because I made a typo. Um, so by doing const, I won't be able to do that. And we'll see, let's see what happens when I try to change b. And you can see even my ID is giving me a squiggly line because it knows that's not allowed, but I'm gonna run here. Assignment to a constant variable. So it told me I'm not allowed to change that. And if I click, and whenever you get errors like this, if you, it'll give you the line number and file. And if you click on this in the inspector, it'll even show you which line it is right here. Um, so yeah, so can't change B. Other than that, between the difference between there really isn't any difference between let and const beyond that. Um, you know, so, and like James pointed out for us, you know, default to using const, use it first. And then if you're like, oh, down, you know, you do a bunch of code, blah, blah, blah. You're like, oh, I really kind of need to change A here. Well, then you can always go back and change it. One of the great things about code is it's very easy to change your mind. Um, you know, unlike, you know, something like carpentry, it's very easy to fix mistakes in code. Um, so yeah, so that's our variables. And then for those values, so in this case, so for our example, I only used um, a number. So in JavaScript, they're called numbers. <laughs> it's nice and simple. Um, in other programming languages, a lot, they'll distinguish between integers, which are basically whole numbers. So one, two, three, four, five, or uh, either, or um, decimal numbers, which are called a whole bunch of different names. Almost done to what I'm thinking. Yeah. Yep, definitely. Yeah, I always start with const and then, yeah, I don't even put any thought into it at first. And then if I need, I'll go back and change. Um, but yeah, so with our numbers, so um, yeah, so we have integers, which are whole numbers, and then we have decimal numbers. Decimal numbers go by a lot of different uh, a lot of different terms in different programming languages. Uh, float, which is short for floating uh, bleh, floating point number. You have double, which is for what double precision. Sometimes they'll call it decimal. Sometimes they'll call it real. Sometimes I don't know. There's a whole bunch of names, but they're all different ways 
of storing decimal numbers. The difference between them is like really technical and it has to do with how they store the decimal part in memory. Um, we won't worry about that right now. Just know that basically we have integers, which are whole numbers, and decimals, which are not. Hey, Glacier. Yeah, uh, upgrade. Got a camera and a mic set up now, so hopefully the audio quality is a little better. Um, yeah, also have a, you know, I got a green screen behind me too, which I was waiting. It showed up today. Um, okay, cool. So yeah, so we have our numbers. We also have our uh, booleans. So a boolean is one of two values, true or false. Um, and we use those a lot when we're deciding what to do with, uh, in a, what we call a condition. Um, we'll be like, if this condition is true, do this. If this condition is false, do this, blah, blah, blah. So we have booleans, true and false. So here, why don't I write this out? Ba, ba, ba. Number. Numbers an integer. And decimal number is float or double or decimal or real or probably some other words out there. These are booleans. Then we have, oh, um, in addition to numbers and booleans, we also have what's called a string. So a string is basically text. It's just, you know, it, it's it's a string of characters is why it's called a string. Um, and this is just literally text. In JavaScript, we have kind of three flavors of string, or how we how we do strings. We have single quote strings, which use single quotes. We have double quote strings, which use double quotes. These two are, in, in some programming languages, there's a difference between these two. In JavaScript, they're 100% identical. Um, the only reason to use one over another is generally personal preference. I prefer the single quote, uh, but some people prefer double quotes. Doesn't matter which one you choose, just be consistent. Don't flip flop back and forth in the same program because uh, that makes your code look messy. So pick one and stick with it. Um, I think single quotes are probably more uh, prevalent and more popular in the JavaScript community. Uh, and other languages won't let you use this one. Uh, and a couple of languages won't let you use this one. But JavaScript, they're totally identical. Uh, one one reason to use sometimes use the other one though is like if I want to say like um, Chris's with an asterisk or with a, a semi quote. I chose a bad name because I don't add you don't add enough there. If I want to have a single quote in there, um, I can use double quotes to put it in there. If I try to do that here, um, you'll see my ID kind of got funny because it's confused and I have to do what's called escaping the character which I put a slash before the the semi or before the single quote so these two these two work exactly the same just obviously this one's a little uglier because I do that so a lot of times if I need to put a single quote in one I'll use a double quote or vice versa this one I'm allowed to um, put double quotes in and this one I can't because, again, it'll get confused on me. So, but I can escape them as well. Um, so, you know, that's a time that, that's about the only time I ever use double quotes, though, is if I have a string for single quotes, I'll usually use double quote for that string. But other than that, completely identical. Um, the third flavor of string we have is a little different. Um, it's called a template string. And it uses the back ticks which if you're not familiar with where those are on your computer because or keyboard because most people don't use these, they're all the way in the top left corner of your keyboard next to the one. Um, they're on the same key with the tilde, which is the little squiggly line. Um, so back ticks have a couple special properties. Uh, we the, the one I want to highlight right now is simply that for this one, we can actually add, put variables inside of here. We do a dollar sign curly bracket and put the variable name. So this would put A into that string and uh, it types it out. Um, you can do the same with the plus sign for other strings. And this is basically the same thing here. It just looks a little cleaner with template strings. So those are our three flavors of, temp of strings. And we'll talk more about them later as, if, as we need things from them. Um, so these three types together, string, boolean, and number, comprise what we call primitives. Um, 
They're called primitives because basically they're the simplest type of data you can have in your program. Beyond primitives, we have a couple other uh, data, well, really we have two other data types in JavaScript and that's pretty close to it, two main types. Uh, we have what's called an array, which an array is basically a collection or list of other things. So like this is an array of numbers. So this created basically a list of five separate numbers and I can reference them individually. And then we have objects. And objects are kind of big and complicated, um, but they're basically just a collection of other bits of data and stuff. Um, but objects basically are what we use to make all the fancy stuff. So we'll be using lots of objects as we go on. Um, but yeah, so those are really our five main types of data that we can have in JavaScript. So not too bad. Um, so yeah, so why don't we actually, let's do something with this code. So we have, um, so why don't we, let's, let's see, we'll keep it simple. What, we, let's, um, let's write the a quick program that will, um, We'll give it a number and we'll just type the number in our code and it'll go find the next prime number for next to that number. So what we'll do, uh, let's first, we'll indicate our start number. So I'm gonna do const start and we'll start with, um, we'll start with eight. So the next prime after eight should be, uh, what, 11? Yeah. So. If our program works, we'll get it to spit out 11. And why don't we, we'll go ahead, we'll console log, and we'll just output starting number, and actually we'll use a template string, starting number, start. And so if I run this, starting number eight. So, um, and it's good to, as you code, it's good to check your program as often as possible. That's one nice thing about JavaScript is it's really fast to go back and forth. Some, pro some programming languages like C++ and Java are what are called compiled languages. And those you have to actually compile or build the code basically, um, before you can test it. So it's a little slower to test. JavaScript's interpreted. So there's no, it doesn't build it ahead of time. It just reads it, it understands it as it gets it. Um, but yeah, but if, regardless of which one though, you want to checking your code often makes it easier to spot bugs because you can do one little thing, check one little thing versus do like 50 things and then try to figure out where the problem is. Um, so I'll well, put our starting number and then, um, what we'll do, let's use a, how do we want to do this? We'll use a let and we'll say current number. So remember, let lets us change our number. So we're gonna start our current number off at start. So that means that, and we'll log current real quick, just so we can see. That means that current is now equal to eight. Um, but because, and it, because it's a primitive, I can change current and it won't affect start. Start will stay eight forever and current I can change. And then what we'll do is we'll do, um, Let's see, we'll do while current, or actually we'll do while not is prime current, current plus plus. So we have a couple things going on here. So first up is prime. This bit right here is a function and we're gonna declare that function right here, is prime. Um, and we'll circle back in a sec. I'm just gonna declare it for a second to get rid of the squiggly. So, um, but a function basically is a chunk of code that you can reuse by calling it. So then we have this not this um, exclamation mark here. This is, um, what is it called? I think it's, is it the negation operator? JavaScript operator. That's what I always call it, but I wanna double check. Which by the way, if you need to Google technical stuff, um, MDN, which is by Mozilla, uh, the same guys that make the Firefox browser. It's an excellent source for JavaScript. That's my favorite source. Um, what do I want? Log not logical. Log ba -ba 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 -ba. Let's see here. Conditional. 
not that one. It should be not equal. Yeah. I just want to make sure I give you guys the correct name. Okay, it's a logical not operator is what, what it's technically called. Um, so basically what, what it does, though, is is prime is going to be a Boolean. So it's either going to be true or false. So I want this condition right here to keep being going while it's not prime. So... As soon as it becomes prime, as soon as it's true, it's going to jump out of here. But I want to check that it's not prime, and then I'll go in here. And then while is what's called a loop. So there's a handful of types of loops, and we'll uh, talk about them. But what loops do is basically it'll keep doing the same code over and over as long as the condition is true. So in this case, our condition is not is prime. So as long as it's not prime, it'll keep running this code. So yeah, while it's not prime. And then this plus plus here is basically the same as doing current plus one. So I'm just increasing the value of current by one. So plus plus is just kind of a shortcut for that. It's called the increment shortcut or increment operator. And plus plus can actually come before or after, which doesn't matter most of the time. Sometimes it does though. The difference is when it's before, it'll increase it before it does anything else. When it's after, it'll increase it after it's done anything else. So like if I was doing like, um, you know, I was adding two things together and then I did plus plus, which this isn't allowed right here, how I have it written. But like if I was doing this, it would add the two together first and then it would increment them. Um, but yeah, so, and so it's, this is called a, a post something, post, post fix operator. There we go. And then a, 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 is it prefix? Yeah, prefix operator. So those are the technical names. Um, so basically what it'll do, it's going to keep looping around and it'll call this function every time. And if it this function says it's not prime, it'll increase it. And now, real quick, I do want to point out um, there is such a thing, or there's a thing called an infinite loop, and that's basically a bug in your code. So, like, if this function always returned false, and returning is basically what this function equals once it's done running. So, if I always returned false, this guy's always going to keep trying because I'm never going to, this condition is never going to be false. So, it's going to keep running this code forever. It's going to run it infinitely. So it's called an infinite loop. Um, that's usually not a good thing. And in fact, it's never a good thing um, because it basically means your program is stuck forever. If there's nothing to kick it out of the infinite loop, I'll run forever. JavaScript is funny because I've noticed that, and you guys probably won't be able to hear it, but um, I'm going to run this in a new tab so I can kill the tab. Let's see. Oh, yeah. I can hear my fans spinning up faster because it's just running infinitely and as fast as it possibly can. So it starts ramping up my computer. So I laugh because that's how I know I got an infinite loop. If my fans suddenly start ramping up, I have an infinite loop probably. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, so what we'll do in here. So this current here in the parentheses for our is prime is what's called an argument. And... I accept those up here. So I'm going to call it, or actually, I'm just going to call this num. So what this does is it's going to put the value of current into num in here. So if I output my num here, and I'm going to return true out of here just temporarily, so I'll only do it once, um, it'll output it, the value of current. If I have multiple things here, I can pass multiples in here as well, and all of and they'll be assigned in the same order. So like, current is the first one, so it'll be in num. Three is a five b six c. Doesn't matter what anything's called down here or if it's variable or not. They'll end up in there in that order. So if we run again, so you can just see I output all those values that I got. Um, so we don't need all those letter once though, we just need num. Okay, 
So now, to figure out a prime number, so a prime number, as I'm sure you all know, is simply a number that's only divisible by itself and one. So like eight, for example, is divisible by quite a few things, or evenly by one. Uh, so, you know, I can evenly divide eight by two, or I can divide it by four, or I can divide it by, well, one. I guess that's actually it, eight and one. Um, but then a prime number, the only values that evenly divide into it, like 11, 13, and seven. I hate seven and 11, by the way, because they're so unfriendly. Um, these are, you know, these are our prime numbers. So mathematically, you figure one, you can figure one out by, um, you know, if you go, if you check all the numbers lower than um, the prime. So if I try, and actually you wouldn't do one, we can already rule out one, and we can rule out 11, the number itself. So if I try 11 divided by two, that's not an even number. 11 by three, 11 by four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Uh, so that's that's the simple way to do it. But then a trick is, if a number is going to be divisible, or if, um, say I have, I don't know, 31. Or so, actually, we'll do it even for, say I have 32. So its kind of smallest multiple is 2, and its biggest one is 16. So um, if I take like 31 now, so... And 16 is half of 32. If I take 31, it, half of it is 15.5. If I go above 15.5, like I'm checking them one by one, and I go above halfway, or in the case of 11, I go above halfway, which would be right here. If it wasn't divisible by 2, my smallest possible multiple, it can't be divisible by anything on this side. So I can cross all of this out as well. So now I only have to check half the numbers. There's a bunch of other tricks to make that set smaller. Um, we won't worry about them now because we don't want to make it too complicated. But there's actually kind of big money in, um, in calculating the next primes and stuff. So there's a lot of research. Uh, I know when I went to school, when I went to college, uh, one of the professors had a program running on literally every computer uh, in the computer science department. Uh, trying to calculate the next prime because there's actually awards. So if you find the next undiscovered prime, you actually get money. So uh, there's a lot of research into both optimizing the algorithm and running a bunch of computers to, to do the calculation. But we'll keep it simple. We'll worry about small numbers. So what we're going to do, well, we're going to use another loop here. This loop we're going to use is called a for loop. And a for loop looks a little funny. Uh, it has three parts. The first part is the initialization part. So this part, we declare some value to keep track of what we're doing. Uh, and for now, I'm just gonna start it at, well, we'll start it at the lowest possible number we need to check, which is two. So I equals two. So I'm making a value. I'm doing it let, because we're gonna change this I over and over, and we're gonna start at two. Then I do a semicolon. Then the second part is the condition. So just like while, while only had a condition, we're going to do a condition here as well. So our condition now is going to be while, or i is less than or equal to num divided by 2. And we're doing divided by 2 because that's how we're chopping things off. So if like I pass in 11, half of it is 5.5 .5 and I shouldn't draw with a mouse. Ugh, grab my tablet. Half of 11 is 5.5, so we're going to, so while i is less than or equal to 5.5, we're going to keep going. And um, our less than greater than signs are pretty much what you would expect, so we use less than and greater than sign, or also called it for on your keyboard your left angle bracket and your right angle bracket, although we left it less than greater than when we're talking math. And then if we want less than or equal to, it's literally a less than sign and an equal sign. And then if we want greater than or equal to, it's greater than sign plus equal. Um, and we also have equal, which um, in JavaScript, well, in a handful of languages, in pretty much every language, the equality operator is two equal signs together. And that's to make it different from the one equal sign, which is the assignment operator. 
Um, so two checks, uh, well, I think JavaScript is actually technically the equivalent. Double check. Normally it doesn't matter if you're using the super technical term, but since I'm trying to teach, I want to make sure I'm using the right term. Uh, and that's not what I want though. The, just the two equal sign. Where are you? Equal. Okay, so they call it the equal sign and the strict equal. So in JavaScript, it's a little funny how it does comparisons sometimes. For example, false equal equal empty string is actually true. Uh, or false equal equal zero, that's also true. Uh, so there's a little bit of funniness with those. Um, so we also have the strict equal. If we use the strict equal, that'll make sure that we don't accidentally check things. So both of these are now false because false isn't strictly equal to an empty string. Uh, so by default, 99.9999999% of the time, you want to use three equal signs. Or if you want the not version, we have not equal and not equal equal. 99.9999999% of the time, you want to use the two, the not equal equal. Um, and you could see, you saw even there where I, um, it turned all yellow because it's trying to warn me, hey, don't do that. You probably didn't mean to use two equal signs here. Different languages are different. Uh, a lot of other languages you'll use two. JavaScript though, always use three, the three character version, unless you have a very specific reason you need to use these. There are a couple, but they're very, very rare. I've probably used it like once in the last three years for like a real code. Um, but yeah, so and these are all called uh, comparison operators, by the way. So back to our for loop, we have our three parts. So we have our initializer, we have our condition, and our third part's the uh, increment step. So here we do something to i to increase it. So here we increase the current each time. Here we're going to increase i. And it's doing the same thing as the current did. It's going to increase i. So basically what this for loop is going to do is it's going to run. It's going to start out. It'll set i equal to 2. It's going to check am i less than uh, num divided by 2. If it is, it's going to do whatever code's in here. Then it's going to go up here and it's going to do our increment. So in this case, it'll increase i by one. Then it's going to check again. Is i still less than or equal to num divided by two? If yes, it's going to keep going. If no, it's going to hop out and go here. So for our prime check, if we go through all of this and we still haven't found a prime, we're going to return false. So getting out of here is going to always be false. And then in here, we're going to check if we're zero, and if we are, we can go ahead and return true, and I'll short circuit everything. So to check if something is an even number, we're going to use what's called the modulus operator. And I'm going to pull this guy up real here, to real quick to show you. Actually, let's hop to Photoshop first. So our modulus operator, so if I do 5 divided by 2, that equals, what, 2.5? Or if you did long division style, um, 2, 5 by 5, I would put 2 up here. 2 times 2 is 4. Subtract those, I have 1. So I have 2 remainder of 1. What the modulus operator does is it gives me this remainder. So if I, and the modulus operator is the percent sign. So if I do 5 mod 2, it's going to equal 1. It's going to give me this remainder. Or if I add, you know, um, what, 11 and 3. So that's 3. That would be 9, 2, remainder of 2. It would give me 2 for 11 mod 3. So if we want to check for an even number, all we have to do is check for a remainder of 0, because that means it divided evenly. So if I mod... Um, or sorry, wait, what am I doing? Yeah, if num mod i, so in our example we've been using if 11 divided by whatever i is, so 2 in this case, equal, 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 three equal signs, 0, that means it's a whole number. Um, so from here, 
this is what I was looking for. I found a prime. So now I want to tell, I want to spit out that I found a prime. So I'm going to return true. Whenever I return, no matter where it is in the function, if I do a return, it's going to immediately stop the rest of this code and go back to where it was. It's going to return to the flow of code. That's why it's called return. Um, so if this is true, or if, if this is true, we're going to return and be done with the code. If not, it'll keep looping around until I eventually hits its condition, and then we'll return false. So now we just made a function that can find the next prime number, or can find a prime number, or sorry, can tell if the number is prime. And then this guy's gonna keep going until, and increasing checking numbers until we find a prime. So now all we have to do, at this point, once this guy returns true, current is a prime number, so we can return current, or we can output current. Prime number is, oh, we'll do template. And we'll say closest prime is, well, next prime, because technically a close prime could go down. Um, that was, that's actually an interview question I usually use. Whoops, our code didn't work, oh no. So we have a problem, so let's debug it. Uh, whenever we're trying to fix our code, we call that debugging, i.e. getting the bugs out. Um, which, interestingly enough, was originally called, or it's called that because the original bug was a moth stuck in some vacuum tubes. And they removed it and then it worked. So that's why we call them bugs, because they used to actually literally be bugs in your, in your electronics. Um, okay, so let's see what we have going on here and why that didn't quite work out. So what we'll do first, let's do um, console.log current. So we're just going to, or actually first we'll do, uh, there, are, there are fancier ways to debug. So you can actually use, um, use a debugger in here and set breakpoints and stuff. We're not going to worry about that right now. Uh, one of my preferred methods for debugging is just console logging stuff um, because it's fast and easy. So we're just going to start out, we'll console log um, current and we'll console log what is prime returns to us. Uh, and with console log, a handy thing, if you want to output multiple values, you just put a comma in between each one of them and you can have as many values as you want and it'll print them out all spaced out for you. So really handy. Um, okay, so eight and true. Okay, so that's interesting. So our function just said that eight is a prime number, which obviously is wrong. So let's see if we can't figure out why. Okay, so... Um, so if we walk through here, so we come here, so we're going to, so when we first get here, current equals eight, we're going to come in here. So that means num equals eight. So I is two. I is two. Ah, yes. Okay. So our mistake is we're looking, we want, we did our prime stuff the opposite way. We we basically wrote the is not prime function because I did them backwards. So we want to um, find, wait, yeah, is prime, is prime. Yeah, because if this equals zero, that is a not prime number. Um, so we just want to make this not. So if it's not equal to zero, mm, that doesn't actually work either. Let me think, sorry. Yeah, no, actually we're good here. We just want to flip these two around because if, if we find a number we can divide by, we know we're not prime at that point, so we can return false. We don't have to check the rest of the numbers. If we make it all the way down here and none of these numbers worked, that means we are true. That means we are prime. So now let's try it. And there we go. Now we have our 11 that we were looking for. So let's change this. Let's go to something bigger that not sh don't know what this prime is. So 124, next one's, uh, or 1245. Our next prime is 1249. 
uh, if we go, you know, blah, 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 something, that might be a little big. And so one thing we have to think about is this is going to go for basically half of this. So as I get bigger numbers, it's going to take longer to finish. Uh, and that might be a number that's too big to finish all on its own. Because um, that's a lot of loops. Chop it down a bit. Oh, yeah. Kind of froze up our tab there by trying to do too much thinking. Uh, so here we go. That number was small enough that we could calculate a prime. So, and that's where I was talking about, like, my professor had a whole bunch of computers running, talking, and they, the computers were actually talking to one another, so it was basically, like, a, a supercomputer type deal, uh, and that was because it takes a lot of crunching to figure out a number, and I think the current prime numbers are way bigger than this largest known, I haven't actually checked in years, so I'm sure it's much, 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 much bigger than last time. All right, let's see, largest prime number is holy cow so it's yeah it's this number with this many digits taken out mm. let's see if we can find an actual picture of it i kind of want to see the whole number da, da, da. yeah that's not the picture okay but yeah so they're really really big numbers there's no way our simple program could do this in JavaScript running on my one computer. It would take to like the heat dots of the universe. Should be a much quicker code solution. And yeah, there definitely is Mystic Seagull. Um, yeah, I mentioned earlier, there's a handful of other things you can do. Um, like there's one involving three. I forget exactly what it is off the top of my head, but you can basically start skipping every three because I think every prime is like 2n plus one or something like that. I forget exactly. Uh, what it is but yeah there's definitely ways you can optimize this uh, I just wanted to keep it simple because because um, I want to keep it simple uh, so yeah so I'm going to just real quick I'm going to copy this code off and I'm going to make a new uh, JavaScript file just so that way um, it's there so you can look at later so what I'm going to do I'm going to after our stream's over I'm going to push the well actually I'll do it at the end of our stream before I turn it off so you guys can see uh, but I'm going to push it up to github uh, github is basic is uh I'd say pretty easily the most popular way to share code between developers uh, so you can anyone can push code up uh, publicly and then other people can download it and see it you can also have private code you got to pay for that um I think I don't know. I do pay for a little bit. I pay for some, so I don't know if there's a free version for private or not. But it's a great way for sharing code. So any code you see me do in the stream will end up on uh, the GitHub account. So you can uh, go download it. So I'll just tuck this in a little file so you can come run it later if you want. You can grab it down. Okay, so cool. So just quick recap what we just talked about. So we talked about our variables, and then we talked about conditions. We talked about two forms of loops, our while and our for. And I don't actually think I mentioned our if. Uh, you, may, you probably figured out what it does. The if basically just, if this condition is true, it's gonna run the code inside of it. If this is false, it's gonna skip over it. Word made for saving code, reap a bit, but yeah. Yeah, that's true. I mean, yeah, a lot of people use it to just store their own stuff. Um, and I use it to store my personal code, uh, private private and public code. So I have, you know, some projects that I've kept um, private uh, to store as well. So it's known as it's what's known as a repository. Um, so it's a repository of code. Uh, but yeah, so I'll push up to that when we're at the end of this. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so got a statements, and then we have returns and truths. And, uh, you know, the funny thing is that's actually a very large chunk of what you need to know for the basics of programming. Uh, so let's go on. Let's talk about now arrays. So, you know, I mentioned our three primitives, numbers, strings, and booleans. And then we have the two kind of fancier uh, types of things, arrays and objects. Um, so an array is a list of numbers, or a list of any values. So I, usually I'm using numbers here, um, but we can we can also put strings in here. I can put booleans in here, and I can even mix and match. You 
probably don't want to mix and match normally. That would cause some issues, uh, but you can. So, you know, I can have really whatever I want in here. I can even have other arrays inside of here. So I can have like, you know, nest, we call those nested arrays. Um, so I can have an array inside an array inside an array. Um, so really just an array is a collection of any value. And then if I have an ex, um, you know, I have my arrays here. An array has, we can check how long our array is by doing array.length. And that'll tell me how many things are in my array. So I'm just going to pop over here, run it. So five. We have five things in our array. Yes, we do. When we, the the spot the, the value is in our array is known as its index. And whenever we do indexes, we always start at zero. So this is index zero. One, two, three, four, and that's it. Um, so the highest index in your array is always array length minus one. So, uh, and to use the index, we just do, we do the, the array variable, we do a square bracket, and then a closing square bracket. And so like if I do array zero, this is gonna give me just the first value. So one. Or if I want the last one, array dot length minus one, because our length is five minus one is four, which gives us the fourth index, which is the last value in this one. That'll output five for me. Um, and then arrays are really great at for um, not only storing like data where you're not sure how many you'll have, like say, you know, you are making a tool for people to be able to schedule events and you're not sure they're gonna have one event, 15 events, 8,000 events. Um, so you can just have one event array, and then as they create them, you just add them into your array here. Um, so they're also good for looping over. So um, just like we did our for loop here, I can use a for loop really easy to loop through my array. So like say, let's make a pro quick little script that will loop over everything, and we'll just multiply whatever's in there by five. So I can use a for loop to do that. So just like before, I'll, my initializer, in this case, I'm gonna initialize to zero because that's the start of our array. And I'll do while i is less than, notice I'm doing less than, not less than or equal to, because I wanna stop before I get to this number. So less, while it's less than my length, so if my length is five, that means it'll do four and then it'll stop before it processes five. And then just i plus plus. And then we'll just output each number multiplied by five. So I'm going to do console log. I'm going to do array of i. So we'll get the ith index. So whatever i is set to times five. Um, and we're on that. So there we go. Five, 10, 15, 20, 25. It just took each number and ran it. And we can like, we'll change this to 10 just to make sure we're not using i. So there we go. Our third one is 50. Um, and I don't think I formally mentioned, but uh, our, for math, for our arithmetic operators in JavaScript, we use plus sign and minus sign, obviously. Uh, for the multiplication symbol, we use the asterisk, which is on your eight key. Uh, you know, it's also called the star. For division, we use one slash, and I always forget which slash is which. There's a forward slash and a backslash, and I, for, I, never, um, I never get it right. After I've been using computers for 30 years and I still never, never get the right one. So, uh, hang on, let's do backslash. So I always double check before I, okay. So backslash is that one. So this is a forward slash then that we use or just call the slash. Um, and then we also have our modulus operator. And then newish to JavaScript, I only learned about this a couple months ago. There's actually now, if you do two stars, you can actually do a power of. So like five to the power of two. I didn't, that's a fairly new thing, newish. Um, so that's really cool. And that's another arithmetic operator. Um, and also I didn't mention what our comments are. So comment, oh, wait, does that operator work in JavaScript? Oh, but that's, um, isn't that a bitwise operator though? Five, 
What is that operator in JavaScript? Yeah, it's a bitwise uh, or operator, uh, X, XOR operator in JavaScript. Yeah. Yeah, so that, yeah, that's a bitwise operator. Yeah, bitwise stuff is basically doing doing math with the, the underlying data, which we'll talk about later. Well, yeah, there's, there's, um, Yeah, because it's the same as this. Yeah, bitwise XOR. Yeah, yeah, bitwise math. We'll we'll talk about it in a little bit. That's that's a little bit different from our regular algebra math. Um, but real quick, I want to mention comments because I haven't actually mentioned comments. I've used them several times, but um, a comment is just basically it's stuff you put in your code that are like messages to the person reading your code, but they don't actually do anything. So there's a couple, there's two, yeah, two ways you can write comments in JavaScript. Uh, you can do a slash slash and then your message, and this only works for one line. So like here, this would be run. Uh, or you can do slash star and then another slash star or a star slash, the, the opposite. And you can see here, um, whenever I type that out um, and hit enter, WebStorm actually puts the closing one for me. And then this is a multi-line. So all of this would just wouldn't have any effect on our program. So that's a handy way to leave yourself notes or leave notes for the, the other developers or put um, you know explanations for complicated code. You'll see some people, um, you know, advocate kind of explaining all your code, like, and that can be good in the beginning. But really, what you want to try to do is you want to try to write your code in such a way that it's what we call self-documenting, which basically means I, you don't need comments to understand what your code is doing. So, like, this is kind of an example of that. So, is prime is a function. I know that. The code inside of here is figuring out if it's a prime or not be based on the name of this. Or if I use like start, and that's kind of a weak one, but I know that I'm starting with this or current, I know I'm current there. So I don't need a comment here explaining this is the current value we're testing. So, you know, because um, if you get too many comments, it can make it actually harder to read. And what ends up happening inevitably is if you get in a really big program and everything's commented, Someone at some point will, especially if you're working in a team, someone will come along and they'll change the code without updating the comment to go with the code. So now the comment's explaining logic that doesn't actually happen. And that creates way more confusion than not having the comment in the first place. Um, but in the beginning, it can be really helpful to um, to do because, you know, it as you're trying to learn how to re understand how to read code, um, you know, it can be helpful for that. Um, but yeah, uh, okay, so did our math operators. Okay, so we got just our little loop to loop through all of those. Um, so we can also in JavaScript, very similar to this guy. Um, so I'm gonna select all this and hit control uh, slash and it's gonna comment the code out for me. That, so it's not gonna run anymore, it won't do anything. So, not Tora, I wanna see your opinion on my solution for this prime. Sure, if you wanna share it. Um, let's take a peek. I like seeing solutions for prime. So if it's one, and yeah, and this is actually, um, yeah, we didn't actually consider one, which is a, uh, a special case we probably should have. Oh, thank you, vegan man. And also that worked. Yay. <laughs> um, so cool. So yeah, return false. It's to return true, and then so um, I'll explain this code for everyone as we go through. So this function is prime. This is a different way to declare a function. Uh, the type of function I used is called an arrow function, uh, which looks like this. This is a just regular function. Um, 
which there are some differences and we'll touch on them later, but just know that this is a function very similar to his prime. And then the switch here, what it does is you give it a, val a number up here and it can be it can be any value really. You give it a value up here and then it'll go through your list of cases. And if this value equals this case value, it's gonna do this code. And so like if n was one, it would go in here. If n was two, it would go in here. And then if it's not any of your cases, you can have a default. So if it's not any of these, it'll do your default. And it'll basically, and it'll go from the start of the case until it hits a break. So like this, if it was one, it would come in here and just do this. If it was two, it would actually keep going. Although actually this is a return, so it won't keep going. But if it wasn't a return or a break, it would keep going. Um, so yeah, so let's see. So four, var x equals two x is less than n, x plus plus. If n mod two is false, then it would, or if it equals zero, it would return false because it just divided, it's not true. And then otherwise it'd return true. And then um, otherwise they'll throw an error to contact the developer because it should never make it this far. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so, yeah. So, yeah, that should totally work, too. Um, yeah, and you actually handled special cases, which we didn't. If if you were writing this for real, you would definitely want to handle those kind of special cases. So, um, yeah, that's good to see. Yeah, I mean, that should work. But, yeah, cool. Thanks for sharing. Um... Okay, so back to our arrays real quick. Um, so just like this for loop, there's also what's a function that we can use called map. All right. Um, so map. So, well, first up, um, this is our first time we've seen this dot other than the length we just used. So an array is actually a special case of object. And an object, like I explained earlier, is basically, well, I said in one line, not really explained. An object is basically a collection of values and functions, and functions are values. So it's basically a collection of values with names and stuff. Um, so you can create a simple one like this and like do something, and that can be an array arrow function or a regular function. Um, and say like that code would be, you know, console log hello as our do something. I can then do the variable name dot the value name do something. And in this case, because it's a function, I can run it like that and it'll output, it'll run that function and do whatever that function says. So in this case, that functions as do hello. So if we do that. <laughs> um, so yeah, or I can like do console a object dot a. So we get one. So it's just basically it groups things together. And there's a lot more to those, but that's good enough for now to to understand. And then when we when um, something's associated with an object, we call them member. Uh, so these are member properties or member data uh, means basically the same thing. Or member methods or member functions. Usually the terminology when it belongs to an object is um, property and method. And then when it doesn't, it's variable and um, function. But really the terms it, terms are pretty interchangeable. If you said a member function, people would understand what you said. Or if you said a method, people would understand what you said. And the super technical, which one's which, actually varies by programming language anyway. So, um, but in general, it's member properties, member methods, and then functions and variables. Um, yeah, so part of that then, so for array, array is an object. It's a special type of object um, that, and when I say it's a special type, it's a special type because it gets a little bit special treatment in JavaScript that can't be done to normal, to just like objects you create, uh, such as being able to use curly, uh, the square brackets. Square bra arrays in JavaScript are the only thing that can be used as square brackets um, to assign values. Um, but array has a whole bunch of member methods. 
So we can see here in my autocomplete, it's kind of showing them to me. And I can also do, um, if I do array, so this array here is what's creating our array, or I can do like this, so I can type here and I can also see them in Chrome. So these are all our different methods that um, we can use. We'll touch on probably a bunch of them as we go along. I'm not gonna sit there and read through and describe each one, because that would be boring uh, and an overload. Uh, but one, the one I wanna use right now is called map. So what map does is similar, or actually let's use for each first, because this one's almost identical to our for loop. So for each accepts a function as a parameter. So I'm gonna do an arrow function and what it'll give me is the value. So it's going to loop through, and so we have five things in our array, so it's gonna call this function five times. Each of those times, we're going to be given the value one, then two, then 10, then four, then five. It's gonna give me each one, one at a time. And if I wanted the index, I can also accept index here, and that would give me the index, the place. So I'd get zero, one, two, three, four. Um, and actually, and then basically with these values, it'll just run whatever code I give it. So we'll actually just, we'll console log each of those out so we can see them. So there we go. So it gave me one for the value, zero index, two, one, 10, two, four, three, five, four. So it just went through each one and did. So if we wanted to recreate our for loop, we can just do value times five here and we don't need index, so I'll take that out. You notice how it grayed this out here. It's telling me, hey, you don't actually need that because you're not using it anywhere. So that's kind of your clue to go ahead and delete it because you don't need it. And if you need it, you can add it back later. So here we go. So we recreated our for loop with the uh, for each method as well. And I would say in JavaScript, at least, this is probably the preferred method just because it looks a little cleaner. You know, you don't have all of this uh, setup stuff here and you don't even have the separate variable you just, or the having to put it in here. So it's just a little cleaner, but functionally it's pretty much the same thing. Um, there's another version of that that's almost the same, but a little bit different, and it's called map. The only difference between map and um, for each is that the map expects you to return something, and it's going to create a new array out of all those things you returned. So in this case, I'm going to return value times five. So now I have a new array result, or and it has each of the values multiplied by five. So we can see here, this is how it outputs arrays if I console the array directly. It gave me an array with all those values. So this is really handy if you need to do some kind of transform on all your values or you need to do something related to, or like on each of your values and stuff, um, you can use the map function. And that would be the same as if I used the for loop method. I could also write a for loop, I could declare result or well, we can even const result. I could do as a for loop uh, b -b 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 result i equals array i times five. So this and this basically are give me exactly the same result. Um, and um, yeah, and just notice when I want to set one of the values in an array, I can just, oh, sorry. Well, yeah, that, that will work. Um, when I want to set one specific value, I can call it like array. Or in this case, because the array is cut off, I can also use dot push. And what dot push does is it pushes a value onto the end of the array. So like right here, result is zero length. So it'll add one, two, three, four, five, and I'll update that array. Um, these two right here are pretty much the same because I know exactly what number I want to map to. Uh, but if I don't know what number, I don't care what number. I just want to stick it on there. Like in our example of, you know, adding events, I would just push every time. Um, and it, if I want to take one of them off, I'm going to do this over here. So const array equals. One of the things I love about JavaScript is you can just open up a console and play with it here too. So like a lot of times if I'm working on a more complicated function, I'll be like, how do I do that function? I'll actually go, um, I'll go and work out the function in my browser and then I go copy that code back in. Um, so if I push six onto here and then I output my array again, 
See, it added the six onto there. I can do the opposite. And actually, hang on, that's kind of a tricky example. Let me, I'm gonna do letters instead of numbers because don't get confusing if they're both numbers. Okay, so my array is letters. And then if I push on F, all right. So I have F there. Uh, the opposite of push is pop. So pop will pop the value off the end of the array. So, and let's see, so it gave me back the array. Oh, and by the way, the six is, it gives you the length, the new length. Um, but pop pops off this value, so it gives me that value, and it took it out of the original array. So see, we have no more F there. There's also, um, so that's from the, the end of the array. If I want to do it on the opposite end, I can do shift or unshift, and that will unshift it off. And I always think the terminology for this is confusing because unshift is the thing that actually adds it. So notice now I have an F up here at the beginning and then shift will take it off. So it gives me all F back and then I have uh, F is off of there. So push and pop or unshift and shift. Um, so uh, yeah, so that's how we can that's what we, how we can play with our arrays. Um, and arrays are really handy. You'll probably use tons of arrays in, in real programs. Um, but yeah, so let's go ahead. Let's make a little program. Uh, let's say, so real quick, let me introduce. I'm going to comment all of this out, and I'm going to undouble comment that. Um, so I want to introduce you real quick to a function that you should, probably never want to use in real code because it or a real uh, like website that you release because it kind of looks pretty ugly um, but it's really handy for quick uh, quick kind of prototyping or examples like this so prompt is a handy function that works in your browser it pops up a little thing and it asks you for a value and then whatever value you give it and I should have console log day whatever value you give it, it's going to set to this variable here. So prompt is returning that, and I'm setting that value onto A, the return value. Um, so prompt is really handy if we want to. So we, we'll use prompt to create some really quick little programs. Uh, that way we can type in some stuff. So let's say um, I want to make a program, and I'm going, I want to accept um, numbers, and we'll say they're student test scores. So I'm going to type in a series of student test scores, and then I'm going to get the average of all those scores. So I'm actually going to delete this. So first up to do that program, I need to create a place to store those arrays, or store those. So I'm going to create a new variable. I want my variable name to describe what I'm doing. Um, you know, really, you don't, the kind of only special case to single letters is things like I. I is pretty standard. It's short for iterator. That's why we start all the way up at I. And then if you need more of them, like you have fours inside, you usually go J, K, L, blah, blah, blah. Or X and Y are used, you know, in math and stuff, just like you use them in algebra. Um, and then you may use A and B where you have like two things that are the same. Other than those kind of cases, you really want to name your your variables and functions and everything else um, in a way that describes what what you're doing. So we'll do scores. And when you name things, you can, you usually name variables in, at least in JavaScript, in what's called camel case. So camel case is basically every word except the first word gets a capital letter. That way you can read it easier. So num score a cap. I don't know why I wrote a cap, but that's what that says. Um, so that's called camel case. And as I discovered from Wikipedia the other day, I knew, knew about some of these, but I didn't know all of these existed. These are all synonyms, apparently, for camel case here. Um, the difference is the really the only two that you'll come across is either um, camel case, and people call it different things, but that'll be with a lowercase, or you'll use the uppercase version for some things like classes, which we'll talk about later. Um, 
So, but yeah, apparently all of these are synonyms for either one or the other. So the most common ones I personally hear are camel case for the lowercase one. I think almost everyone uses that, um, that terminology. And then either Pascal case or uh, capitalized word. Yeah, see, the one I hear all the time is in, actually on here. I usually call uh, Pascal case capital case just because it's pretty obvious what that means. Um, but yeah, but there's all kinds of different ones on here. I haven't heard of half of these. So, um, but yeah, so we usually name variables in camel case. So if you have multi words, you just capitalize letters. Okay, so back to our program. So we're going to start with scores. And then what we'll do, we'll keep asking for a new score until we type negative one. Once we type, well, any, we'll say any negative number. So if I type in it, because hopefully you don't have an evil teacher that gives you a negative test score. That would be the worst teacher ever. So we'll assume that any negative numbers mean, hey, I want to stop. So that means, so we want to keep going while our value isn't that. So we need a place to put the value each time we get it. So we'll say let input, and we're doing let because we, we're going to reuse it, so we're going to change it every time. And notice I don't have an equal anything here because I don't need to have one. If I don't want it set to anything because I'm going to like set it right away before I use it, I'm just going to not set it to anything. And then, so kind of like while input is greater than zero. Um, so we have a couple problems with this. First up, my input doesn't equal anything, so I don't really want to check because I want to do scores.push input here. But if I do that, um, it's going to push nothing. It's going to push what's called undefined. Uh, when we have a variable and you haven't set it to anything, you haven't defined it as anything, it's undefined. And that's actually a data type. Um, undefined is what it's set to. So we don't want undefined going onto our array. So what I'm going to do instead is use a different type of loop. It's almost the same as while with one key difference. It's called a do while loop. And it looks like this. Our condition goes down here at the bottom and it ends with a semicolon. Um, so a do while loop is going to do whatever is inside of it once, the first time it hits it, no matter what. Then it's going to check the condition, and if the condition is true, it'll keep doing it again. So, like, basically, a while will do zero or more things because it may not run at all. Like, if I have, you know, while false, for example, it's going to skip right over that because it's false the first time, so it won't ever do anything. So that's going to run zero or more times. Do will always do it at least once. So, um, so always run at zero, one or more times. So I'm going to use a do while, and then I'm going to do input equals uh, prompt uh, enter score or negative one to exit. We won't, we don't want to tell them that they can enter any negative number, but that's what we're actually going to do. Um, so here I'm going to run it once. So I'll ask first and then I'll keep prompting. So blah, 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 doesn't actually matter what I do. Well, wait. oh, right, because it's not greater than zero because I didn't enter a number. It's not a number. It's actually a string. So prompt is always going to be a string. Even if I type five here, and, oh, wait, oh, there's a JavaScript being its fun self. Pretend that didn't work. I'll tell you why that worked in a second. But so if I enter five here, and it's not really showing it, so, but five here was a string and you can't really tell, but it is. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to do parse. We're going to wrap our prompt in parsint. So parsint is just going to attempt to convert the, um, a string that has a number in it or that like is a number. So like, um, const a equals five. So that's a string of the number five. So parsint will turn that into an actual number five versus if I just output a. So you can see the difference here. This is how Chrome shows it to us. Um, so I'm going to convert it to a number. And then that converted one, I'm going to add to my array. And then, um, and so I'll just keep going here. So five, kept 10, 25, 29, blah, 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 negative one and it exited. So that gives us a loop. And then just real quick, um, 
the thing I told you to pretend didn't work. Uh, I want to explain why it worked real quick. Five greater than zero. So this is this worked similar to how I told you, like false equal equal empty is true. Um, because what JavaScript does by default is it will coerce the data type, which basically means it will look at what you're trying, what's on either side, and it'll try to find some mix that it knows how to put together, and it'll try to put them together. Um, some and sometimes you don't want that to happen, just like when I didn't want it to be a string there. Um, in almost every other programming language under the sun, this would have always been false, or it would have thrown an error because you can't technically compare a string to a zero. But JavaScript's like, hey. I know some combination that work. Let me do some changing stuff. Um, but now that we got our parse in, we're all happy. Um, but there is one gotcha in here, and that is that our score, um, we're going to end up pushing that negative score. So let's, after we finish our loop, we'll output our scores. So 5, 10, well, whatever, that was a 19. Negative 1. So... Our negative one ended up on there. A couple ways we can handle it. Um, one way we could have an if statement here, and we can check if um, if only if it's greater than we can um, put it on. If or we could always put it on, and then just here know that we're going. We need to take one off, and we'll just take it off and chuck it away. Uh, that's another way. Or we could switch this back to a while and have one prompt before the while starts and then go into the while. Uh, that's another way. All of them have you know pros and cons. I think probably the most appropriate would be this one. Um, you know, they all kind of end up duplicating data, some kind of code. Uh, I, so I would personally, if I was working on a real project like this, either go with this, I might go with this, but this is kind of bad performance wise because it ends up having to do extra work that it doesn't need to do um so probably you don't want to do this way so this is probably your safest bet here um but yeah um okay so yeah so now we have our list of scores so now if i type in the scores 50 25 10 really bad score negative one so here's my array and i have all the scores i just entered so now we want to take the average. So just a refresher of how we do averages just from a math perspective is we add up all the numbers and we divide that by the number of numbers that we just added up. So 1 plus 2 plus 3 is 6. So 6 divided by 3, our average was 2. Or 5 plus 7 plus 9 divided by 3. Uh, well, I need to stop doing 2s because the average is always going to be the middle number. <laughs> 11 plus 27 plus 3 divide by 3. So that's what, 41? 41 divided by 3 is, what, 13.6-ish? Repeating? So that's our average. So that means first, for programming, we'll do once, we'll do, we'll figure out the sum, and then we'll do the division. So, um... To do the sum, we have we can use a for loop for that. So let sum equal zero. So we'll start our sum at zero, and then we'll use a for loop. So let i equal zero, i is less than scores dot length, i plus plus, and then we could just do sum plus equal scores i. And I didn't haven't hadn't mentioned these ones yet. These assignment operators. But these guys basically are um, shortcut versions of doing this. So if you're just adding or multiplying or dividing or subtracting or modding some number and assigning that result to itself, you can use this guy plus equal. So those two are the same thing. Here, I'll leave it there in a comment just so you can see. There's, these two are the same thing. So we're going to add up all the scores and then we'll just console log or sum just to make sure that worked. So I'm going to I'm going to do 5 3 times so our number result should be 15. 15. Cool. So we got our sum. And then to get our result, our average, we'll just do sum divided by 
how many things we added up, how many things we added up is course.length. So then if I console log, we'll get average. And average, let's do this. Average scores. We use a template string for that. And again, this and yeah, it's going crazy. Sometimes when you type weird type weird things, your uh, ID kind of works against you. So these two are the same thing too. I just tend to like template string. Um, in the really simplest cases, it doesn't matter. And in fact, with console log in particular, I could even do this, which is also the same thing since it spaces them out. But uh, when you're working on things, template strings tend to end up looking the nicest out of all of them and the easiest to understand. And that's one of the keys when we're writing code. We want it to be understandable. One of the best quotes to live by when you're a programmer is always write code assuming the person who's going to have to maintain it is a... Hang on, I'm butchering the thing. My favorite code, I can't remember. No, uh, that sounds cool, but that's not what I'm after. Robot with chainsaw. Um, hang on. Up oh, there. Is this the one? Yes, this is the one, maybe. Although this is a parable. No, that's not it. Come on, someone. This is like one. Uh, chainsaw knows where you live. Here we go. This will be it. Always code as if the guy who ends up maintaining your code will be a violent psychopath who knows where you live. Words to live by. Um, so always write your code in a clean, understandable way because you can really do create really ugly stuff. Like technically, this whole program, I'm going to put it in a new file just so I don't blow it up. Um, whoops. Technically, I can write this program all in one line like this, except, oh, no, we're good, with commas and all kinds of garbage, and it'll still work. And in fact, uh, there's there's what we call ugly, um, well, except with the comments, comments would screw it all up. There's things called uglifiers or minifiers and stuff, and that's actually what they do. They do it for the purpose of making it smaller so you can send it but you don't want your real code to look like that. They'll always do like an extra transform and it won't touch your original code. Um, but yeah, so you can write some really, really terrible hideous code, uh, but don't do that. You always wanna make it as readable as possible. If you have to, what, you know, once you get some experience reading code, what, if you have to, you know, look at something for more than 30 seconds to figure out what it's doing, that might mean you need to tweak what it's, how, how it's doing it because it might be a little complicated. Um, okay, so let's just output our code. Okay, so uh, I'm going to do one, two, three, and we sh and negative one, and so our average, our sum was six, and our total should have been two. So there we go, two. So I wrote that with a for loop. Um, another way to do it, because we have it in array, is very similar to the for each and the map functions we used on our array earlier. There's also a function called reduce. And this is one of my favorite functions. Um, it's a little, little different than the other two. So what it does is it takes a function and it takes a start value. So in this case, we're summing, so our start value is zero. And it'll give me two arguments to my function. The first one is the resulting, is the, the result. So in this case, because my result is gonna be a sum, I'm gonna call that sum. And then the second one is the current value I'm on. So just like map would give me the current, the each value of each step, that's what this value is going to be. It's just comes second in this parameter. Um, and then what I do inside here is I return the new value for this step. So I'm going to return sum plus value. So what it's going to do, it's going to come in here, it's going to set sum to our initial value, so zero. So this will be zero, and then value will be the first value uh, in the array. So if I do one, two, three, it'd be one. So it's gonna do zero plus one, return that, that 
which equals 1. That 1 would now be sum. The next value in the array will be given to me 2. So 1 plus 2 is 3. Return that. So sum is 3. Value is 3. 3 plus 3 is 6. And then it's out of value, so it's going to return that to me. So um, sum equals here. So I can get all that in one shot with my reduce function. Um, and then I can take that and divide it by divide it as well. So one, two, three, negative one. So same exact functional thing as um, as our for loop. Just in my opinion, it's a little bit cleaner and easier to understand code. And you can actually simplify this down a little bit more because arrow functions, if they're one line and they re only return a value, well, even if they don't return a value, if they're one line, you can actually not have the return keyword. And actually here, let's leave this one here so we can compare. Um, you can get rid of the return keyword, get rid of the curly brackets and the semicolon, and this will just, whatever is here, will be the return value. So these two are functionally equivalent as well. So doing it like this, it becomes nice and easy to read. So we're just reducing our array, and it's called reduce because it's reducing to one value. So reducing an array to one value, that's why it's called reduce. Um, so we're just gonna loop through and do that. So we get a nice little one liner there. Three and negative one to stop. So, and um, we could also do divide by squares dot length here and get our average in one shot. Um, this is probably okay. This is where you you start running the risk of is that psychopath that knows where you live going to pay you a visit or not? Uh, as you start adding stuff to the line, I personally I would do this. Um, if you're still beginning, it helps to break it out more. Or if you're going to work with beginners. So like, um, I'm actually a tech lead where I work, a like senior developer that works with the team. And, uh, you know, I work with more junior developers. So I will, there I'll write my code a little simpler than I write into my personal projects because I know I'm working with, um, you know, people who have worked with code less. So I want to make sure it's still readable for them too. Um, but you know, I think this is probably, this is pretty appropriate at both levels because you're, you're getting a sum and then you're just doing one extra thing to it. So, but either way works. Um, again, when you're writing your code, it's up to you to, you know, kind of decide what is and isn't complicated and good. Or if you're working on a team, it's up to the team. Um, my team always has conversations to, um, to, you know, talk about code style and we'll be like, hey, you know, let's look at this. Oh, that's ugly. Let's change it. Let's, we want to do it like this. Or no, I think that's good. That's a good pattern. It's easy to read. So we would always be talking about, you know, what works and what doesn't in our code so we could work better as a team and, you know, make our code better. Um, okay. So there we go. So that's our arrays. Uh, so I'm gonna just make another file and chuck that code into there um, just so it's there if you want to pull it down and then we'll blank out our index again. Um, oh, and if you want to run these codes, all you have to do, if you come in your index and just change which file this points to, it'll go load up that file instead of index so you can still keep running that code. So, um, or you can make separate indexes as you want if you want it instead. Um, okay, so we talked about our primitives, kind of played with them a bit. We talked about conditionals and loops, and then we talked about arrays. Uh, let's talk about um, objects a bit now. So, you know, we talked, we already talked about how objects have member data and member methods. Um, but what we haven't really talked about is when we want to use these. So um, objects are part of a paradigm called object-oriented programming, which is basically tries to um, think of think of programming data in terms of kind of real-world objects to make it easier to you know conceptualize and think about. So, for example, if I was making a game, I might create an object called player. And I might give him things like lives. Um, you know, I might give him a method called move. I might, uh, you know, give him a name. You know, whatever kind of is associated with that player, I might give him to that. And then, you know, I might have a similar one called enemy and it may have 
you know, it may have health. Um, you know, it may have a speed, etc., etc. You kind of see where I'm going with this. We group things together. The classic example is kind of like a, a car and wheels and stuff. So we try to think about, um, you know, objects in real world because then it makes your code a lot easier to understand and conceptualize. Um, so this is kind of a simple way to create an object. So this gives me one object called player with these values on it. Um, but if I want to make lots of those, then this is kind of a clunky way to go about that. Um, so player, I may only have one player, but enemy, you know, I, if you, I, you've probably never played a game that has exactly one enemy. So what we can do with that is create what we call a class. Um, so a class, so if you think of an when we have it like this, we call this an instance. Um, so we have an instance of our enemy. If you could think of the class as a blueprint for creating enemies. So your class is basically your blueprint. Um, so what I'll do here is, so enemies have what's called, or sorry, classes have what's called a constructor. And that's the first code that's run. So here I'm just going to say, you know, making an enemy. And in JavaScript, a constructor is always uh, called constructor, just this word exactly. Um, and that's a constructor. And it can have values or not. Um, but it's always called constructor. In, a lot, in most other programming languages that have classes, uh, the class would actually be named the same or sorry, the constructor would be named the same as the class. So this would be the constructor in like Java or C Sharp, C++, et cetera. But in JavaScript, that's a constructor. Both function, all of them function the same way though. And then, so that's my enemy blueprint, my enemy class. And then I'm gonna make an instance of the enemy. And to make an instance from a class, we say new and then the class name and then um, uh, parentheses. And if I had parameters, like say I want to give it lot, pass in lives or health, I could pass in health, just like an, any normal function. So this is going to create a new instance of enemy for me. And right now enemy doesn't have anything. So if I console log enemy, it's not going to say anything, but we will get our, we will get the making an enemy bit because constructor is going to be called. So making an enemy, and then we can see it's empty except for this prototype bit. So this prototype here is, so even the, so JavaScript having class is actually fairly new to JavaScript, relatively speaking, because JavaScript isn't technically a class uh, based language. C Sharp, C++, uh, Java, those languages are class based languages. Um, and they're all object oriented, but the difference is JavaScript was known as a prototypal language. Um, the difference is pretty subtle, and at this point, I don't think it's important to understand what the difference is. But um, and the difference is really subtle in ninety nine percent of use cases. But basically, the the key kind of difference is in JavaScript, you basically create a prototype of that object. So you like essentially create that object, and then you use create copies of that prototype basically with different values. Whereas a class, it's more concrete. This is a blueprint, this is the object. That's not a great, that's a very oversimplified explanation of it. Uh, you know, just for now, remember JavaScript's a prototype language, but don't worry too much about what the difference is. Um, so when we create a class here, really what it's doing is, is creating um, it's creating a thing that I'll create it. Chrome still, Chrome natively supports class, so it's going to output this directly. Used to, before it got native support and you transpiled it, you'd get this funky looking thing that would do it the prototype way. Um, but don't worry about that for now. Just know that this prototype on our empty enemy is just the, the basis. And all classes extend object. Object's basically the most simple version of ob of an object you can have. Uh, so, and all of them extend it. Um, and it just has a couple things there, but, uh, but for the most part, enemy doesn't have anything in it. 
So if I want to give enemy something, I can come in here and I can do this dot health equal health equals health. I'm going to get rid of this guy. So now if we console log this, my enemy has a health here. So what I did here, the this keyword um, says whatever comes next uses the current context of where it is. So the context um, context in general is in different places. Your, your this refers to different things, basically. So when I use it inside of a method inside of a class, this refers to the instance of the class I make. So it doesn't refer to the blueprint itself. It refers to the, the thing I'm making with the blueprint. So, and then I'm just saying, so set health, set this instance's health to the health variable I just passed in. So these two line up, and then this one could technically be Cookie Monster here for our all JavaScript cares. Um, so we get Cookie Monster instead. Um, but we'll go with health. Um, so yeah, and then I can also, I can change that health out here too. So like if I wanna change my enemy's health and I wanna set it to 50, for example, or I wanna say, Maybe more realistically, I'm going to subtract 10 from it because, you know, the enemy got hit, so it's going to lose some health. Um, I can change it, and that will keep track. So now you can see that health is 90. And if I make, like, a second enemy, enemy 2 is new enemy, give it 500 health, it's a boss or something. And I'll, I'll, I'll console log both of these. And we can just see each enemy has its own health and subtracting 10 from this one didn't affect this one. They're, they're completely separate from one another, but they use that same blueprint. Um, so that's how we create a constructor for it. And then we can also, and this is a bit of a newer syntax. So this will only work in um, the most recent versions of Chrome, unless, or you can transpile it. We'll talk about transpiling later, um, but we can declare them up here. And I recommend you do this and, Oh, actually, oh wait, uh, I deleted it, I need to, hang on. So what this line of code does is um, pretty much absolutely nothing. Uh, but the reason I still suggest you put it up here is because it makes it a lot easier to, if you if you always do this for all of your variables you're setting inside of there, it makes it a lot easier to know what you have in there. Because I can technically, you know, I may have, you know, 50 different functions on this, which if you do, you probably should break it up into multiple classes, but I may have a really complicated class. And down here, I set some cake and you know, there's like a whole bunch of other code in here making it hard to see. I may not know that cake is even a thing, but if I declare cake up here, I can be like, oh, cake's a thing. Where and what does that do? So um, I recommend you declare them up there. And then there's another very new concept that Chrome supports natively now, which are private methods. Um, just to call it something. So, or sorry, well, private variables. It doesn't actually support private methods yet. Um, but a private variable. So with classes, we have a concept of, of um, access levels. So we have in JavaScript private and public now, and private is very new. Um, other languages also have a third one called protected, which is kind of a middle ground. We won't worry about that one right now, but public and protected. So public means the data is public. It can be accessed by anyone. Private means it's private to the instance of the object you're making. So only that can access it. So health is public. So that means outside of health, I can, or outside of enemy, like just down here, I can get a hold of that. I can't do the same thing for the private one. Enemy dot this is private. It won't let me. And I think it'll yell at me specifically. Yeah. So here it'll tell me private field blah 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 must oh wait, hang on. This is private. This is Do I have that? Oh, no, never mind. It is yelling at me at that line. It's just a little bit different message than I expected. Uh, but basically, it's saying, and, and there, IntelliJ gives, or WebStorm gives us a better one. Private member is not accessible. 
it can't be accessed out here, but it can be accessed in here. So like if I say, um, you know, if I have to do something, I can output that value here. I'll say, hey. So if I call enemy dot do something, it'll console log that, that value for us. So hello. Um, and there's a lot of reasons you want to make things private. And in fact, I would say just kind of like our const let rule, you probably want to have a rule of start with private and make it public only if you need to. Uh, the reason for that is there's a couple things. One, if you um, keep things private when you're trying to use them. So I'm going to store that as a global variable. If you're trying to use them, it's a lot easier to know what you're allowed to use if all the private stuff is hidden because see here I only have health as an option The this is private even though it shows up here it doesn't show up in here so I can't use it so it makes it easier to know um, you know what's something that's just kind of inside there so that is used for internal stuff that I don't really need to worry about uh, we call that encapsulation uh, so we try to try to hide things inside of things so instead of having to memorize your whole program at once you just have to know Okay, enemy has a health and move function. I don't have to necessarily know what that move function is doing if I don't care at that point. Um, and then the other, another good use of it is say, um, say I have like a, I want to keep track of, um, what do we want to do? Let, uh, let's say I don't want people, want, I don't want to let health become negative because a negative health doesn't make sense. You're like, what, extra dead if that happens? So what I want to do is every time someone tries to set health, I want to check that value before I set it. And if it's going to make me lower than zero, or if it is lower than zero, then I want to make it just zero. I'm going to not let it go below zero. So what I can do... And uh, kind of first, we'll do kind of the old school way. The old school way would have been would be uh, we make this health private. So then this line isn't allowed anymore. Well, it if I change that too. Um, so I can't do that anymore. And then what we would have old school style would be a function we'd call get health, and here we would return the health. That way we could read out the value. And then we we'd have set health, and set health would take the value, and we would do something with it. So we can say like if value is less than zero, this dot health um, equals zero, else this dot health equal value. And I don't think I mentioned else yet. So else is kind of like that default from the switch statement. If this isn't true, then it'll do the else value if it gets here. We can also have else if, so if I have another condition here, um, it would do that, and I can daisy chain them together. So I can have like, I, you only ever have one if, in, one if by itself in your chain, then you can have any number of else ifs, and then you only have one else at the end of your chain, if you want. And you can like leave off whichever bits you want. So we're just gonna do if, if else. So if our value is less than or equal to zero, we're gonna go zero. Else, if it, is greater than, if it's not less than zero, it has to be either be greater than or equal to zero, so that we're fine with that, we're gonna set it to value. And then how I would use this, I'm gonna comment this out, is I would do health value to, or set health like 10. And then to read it out, I would do get health. So we can just see it, you know, it does kind of what you would expect. The One of the, the biggest annoying things with this pattern is I can't use my negative equal bit, so I have to do dot get health minus 10 if I want to subtract 10 to it. So that's kind of annoying and ugly. Um, so again, that's old school. New school, almost the same thing, except much, much, much better. So new school, we're gonna create, and that was called, so that was called a getter and setter. This is also called a getter and setter, but it's like a formal get or a, a language construct getter and setter. So, Almost identical. The only thing I difference I did was I put a space and I lowercase the letter, um, 
And, but now the big difference between these is instead of calling them like they're a function, I can actually go back to my original, um, my original thing here. And JavaScript will handle the whole calling get and set and making sure. So when this value gets here, it won't be, because I'm doing minus equal, it won't be 10, it'll already be 90 for me. Um, and then it'll run through this code for me. So like we can test that by I'll set it equal to uh, negative 10,000, which is definitely against our rules. So if our code runs, then it should make it equal to zero. If it doesn't run, it'll be equal to that. And there we go, zero. So that meant our code ran. Or, and we can also check, you know, we can come here and we can put a console log. So, so you can see it, it came in and it was negative 10,000, but we did our code and we set the value to it. And if we do negative equal 10, we can see the value coming in will be 90 because it take, goes ahead and it does all the, all the bits for us. So much, much, much better. Still basic, same basic fundamental uh, thing. And what I do is if I want the player to, if, if I'm writing a program like this, I'm like, okay, I want people to be able to change the health. If I don't have any rules on that, I'm going to just, um, <coughs> I'm going to make it public to start because then they have this code. And then you down, down the line, I'm like, oh crap, they're making health negative and that's causing all kinds of issues. Well, I can come in here and change this, this to private and add a getter and setter. And as long as my getter and setter functions basically the same and has the same data type and keeps the same name as what was a public variable, they don't have to change their code at all. The other code doesn't have to change. So um, so yeah, I always start with, with it public Again, if, if it's something I want people to be able to change. By default, if I don't know if I want them to change it, I make it private to start with. But if I know I want them to change, be able to change it, then I'll make it private or public. And then if I later on figure out, oh, I need to add rules around that value, I add a getter and setter to wrap it up. Um, so yeah, so those are getter and, getters and setters. And then as I've done several times at this point, um, you know, we have methods, and methods can take variables. So um, let's make a method, and we'll do like say hi to name, um, and I'll do like console log hi name, and then so that's a method I have down here, and I can do enemy dot say hi to Chris. So just like a normal function, it'll you know, take variables and use those variables. Nothing special about that. Um, I can use this in here. Um, so my health is this dot health. So I can access this. All right. Thanks for joining, sweet not sour. Uh, if you want to catch the rest, it will be up on uh, YouTube either tonight or tomorrow. So. Thanks for joining, uh, and have a good night. Um, <laughs> okay, so, yeah, we have our, oh, thank you. Um, we have uh, methods. So, this is our, this is basically, you know, the things that a class has. So, one cool thing that makes classes really powerful, and let's actually, we'll, we'll chuck this code into a new file. One of the things that make classes really cool is what's called inheritance. So inheritance lets you basically inherit all the traits of another class and then add on to them. So kind of like how you inherit, you know, your like nose from your parent or something, but you know, you're different. Um, it's kind of the same way. So like, for example, let's say we have a class called animal. And animal has a function called speak. And we're going to say that our generic abomination of an amorphous animal just says yo as its, as its bark or whatever. So then um, let's say instead we want to make a different, we want to make a slightly different animal. 
we're going to make a dog. So a dog can also have a speak function and it says bark. So when a class extends something, we call that, and then it has a function the same, we call that overriding. Uh, so dog overwrote the speak function of animal and has his own. So now I'll make an animal and then I'll also make a dog and I'll call I'll console.log or actually we'll put the console.log in here. You work. So now I'll have animal speak and I'll have dog speak. So notice our animal said yo and our dog said bark. So it didn't call the the speak of animal because we overwrote it. But say, um, let's see, we'll give another um, another function. What function should we do? We'll call it, um, oh no, sleep. So when we sleep, an animal goes to sleep. So I'm going to have our animal sleep. I'm also going to have our dog sleep. So even though I didn't override this here, I don't have any kind of sleep in dog because dog extends animal. It has everything that animal has that I don't ex that I don't override. So both our animal and our dog are able to sleep. So you can use this to create a type that fits a certain thing. Um, so like say we were doing something like um, uh, what? A graphics card. Or say, not even a graphics card. Let's say we have, uh, you know, a... I don't actually... What's a general term for things that go in there? We'll call it a slottable item. So, you know, inside your computer you have those slots and you can put your graphics card, but you can also put other things in there. So we can have a class called slottable item. And slottable item has, you know, rules about what what things it has. So like it may have a method like turn on and turn on needs to do something. But then we extend that to, uh, so here we have a slottable item and it has a method turn on. And turn on won't do anything for the generic slottable item. But then we may have a graphics card which extends slottable item and then it does do something in there. Show pretty pictures. Uh, or we may have something like a uh, uh, sound card. Do people still have separate sound cards? I haven't seen one in a long time. Uh, comes with a uh, sound card. Or we may have, you know, what else goes in there? A USB adapter. You know, whatever they may be. Um, and then in my code, I can have code somewhere. Goodbye, animal. <coughs> that expects certain things to happen. So, um, you know, like say we have, you know, startup sequence. So start and we have a list of slottable items. And it has a new graphics card in there. It has a new sound card. It has a new USB adapter. This sounds like an initial build, which means it won't actually work the first time, just like initial builds never do. Um, I have a slottable item. And so we have a startup sequence function. Whoop, equal. And our startup sequence is just going to loop through all of our startup items. And it's going to call startup item dot turn on, and then we'll run our startup sequence, and each one turned on. So I don't care what turned on really. I just wanted them all to turn on, and because they all extend it, I know that they all have a turn on function. So even though I don't necessarily know which type of slottable item I'm building with, I know that they all can turn on. And we call that an interface. Um, 
in JavaScript, they don't. There's not a interface um, type. In other languages like Java and C, C Sharp, which are actually truly class based, they do have interfaces. So um, it kind of looks like this. And again, this is not uh, valid JavaScript, but it would be valid in other languages. You would have just turn on, and you would just be like, "Hey, do it. Make a turn on function." Um, but um, but yeah, in JavaScript, we wouldn't do that. So like what I would do is I would either leave this blank or what I do a lot of times, if every class is absolutely supposed to implement this because there isn't any default logic, I would throw an error here. And errors are just like you guessed, they are an error. And I'm using new here because I'm creating a new error. So errors are actually objects. They're, they're classes basically, just like we've been doing. And I'm gonna throw an error. So when you throw an error, that basically breaks your program. So if I make a new class called bad item that extends slottable item, and I don't implement that, I don't override turn on, so that means when I call turn on, it's gonna run this code. So I'm gonna come down here, I'm gonna say make a new bad item. Boom, it threw the error. And then just whatever I put in here is just the text that outputs right here when I throw the error. So what I'll do is if I'm making something that I want a base thing and I want them to all have logic, but I don't want, there's no default, they need to all implement it. I'll do this and that way if, if I forget and then I call it, I'll be like, oh yeah, I gotta go build that function. So console.log, not bad anymore. And now we'll work again. Um, so yeah, so that's what it, so yeah, um, you know, that's what extending does. And then there's one, and like say, um, you know, if, if slottable item has a name for it, it, has some property, these guys can access it and set it too. So slottable, um, and I go down into like graphics card and I'll do this dot name. They inherit the properties as well, uh, and they can override them. So if this guy overrode name graphics card, it'll put its it'll show the overridden one as well. So they work just like functions do. You can override those as well, um, <coughs> and you can also say um, say I want this dolly's output like starting up. Um, what I can also do what call the super. So when you have something that extends, um, they're either called uh, child class and parent class. So this one would be the child, this one would be the parent, or they're called sub class and super class. So inside of any function I'm overriding, I can do super dot function name and I could call the the version of this that exists in my super class in my parent so we can see here it did starting up and then it did this so it just ran that and then it added on to it so if you want to like add on to the function you can do it this way and similarly we if we have a constructor notice it got red on me because if your class extends something your constructor always has to call super, just like this, no no dot anything. So it'll call the super constructor. And when you don't have a constructor in there, there's basically an implicit constructor that just does nothing. Um, but if I like, I could add one here real quick. Constructor, console.log, super constructor. So this super now is gonna call that for graphics card. Super constructor, and actually it called it for all four of them because they all end up calling constructor, even though I don't have the super bit in here because they all have an implicit one. So it's the same as not being there. Um, but yeah, so using that, you kind of start building out, um, building out all your different bits and pieces of your program. And so if you, ch if you uh, tune into one of the regular streams, You'll see working on a more, uh, which the next one's on Sunday. You'll see we use classes all over the place. So we have like, uh, this is our current main project. We're working on a little, we'll start it up real quick. 
We're working on a little game. I like to teach with games mostly because games are fun. And they're also being visual helps, makes it, um, uh, you know, easier to look at, easier to understand. Uh, I apparently broke it. Oh, no, there it is. I just was, did it too fast. So we're working on a game right now. It doesn't do much uh, yet, but our character can move around and stuff. But we have, so like, we have a player class, and we have a chicken class, and we have a map class, and all kinds of different classes going on. So we use that to organize our code. Uh, we have game scene class, a map class. Usually, um, when you're writing classes, you want to do one class per file. Uh, you can have multiple. Obviously, we just were. We had, like, 10 classes in here, five classes. Um, but usually for organization's sake, for the uh, the psycho who knows where you live, um, we do one class per file just to make it easier to, to find because individual classes can start getting pretty long. Like if we look at player, it's getting long and this is just one class, so we wouldn't want to stick a second and third class in there. Um, but yeah, so classes kind of form the basis of how we'll group and organize our code. And the nice thing about classes are so like my player for example has a move function a move function is kind of complicated it's got a bunch going on in there but when i just want him to move i don't have to worry about how he's moving uh unless there's a bug in there and i have to go fix it but if i'm just using it i just have to call move i don't care what that is and that's where we that's both encapsulation so we're we're putting related things inside one another, but we also call that abstraction. So uh, an abstraction is basically, I'm abstracting away all the logic for move. So conceptually, I'm just thinking it, of it as make the player, move the player. Um, I'm not thinking of, okay, set, figure out the player's acceleration and then add the, that, the current acceleration tick to the velocity and then move the player's position by the velocity and blah, blah, blah. It's doing all that, but it's all abstracted away. So I don't have to worry about that at this point. I just have to worry. The player's moving. So that's how we're able to take really, really big programs and still wrap our head around them because we abstract away and hide that logic. So you only have to worry about a small chunk of logic at any given time. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Um, and now, believe it or not, that's pretty much all the all the kind of main syntax stuff you need to know about Java. So obviously, there's still a lot to learn. Um, so this is kind of what we did here was essentially uh, kind of the equivalent of learning the alphabet. We learned the alphabet and we learned a couple of words. So um, you know, we now know all the little bits that go into our code. We don't necessarily know how to string them together yet. Um, so, um, you know, our next lesson, we'll, we'll do a bunch more examples and we'll start learning how to make words. And then eventually those words become paragraphs and those paragraphs become books and those books become libraries. And that's how we write programs. One little baby step, one little letter at a time, just like when you're writing a book. Um, so, uh, yeah. So let's go ahead and I said, I'll uh, get this up on GitHub. So let's go, whoops. Let's go, I'm gonna go to GitHub, and GitHub is really cool and it's free, uh, so I recommend signing up if you wanna get into coding, because it's always nice to, um, A, it's a good place to store your your personal code, if, especially if you don't mind people other people seeing it, uh, but B, it's a good place to share your code if you want, and um, I don't know if you guys noticed, or were here when he did it, but Mystic Seagull shared a gist link. Um, I'll open it up again here. So a gist, uh, gist is in GitHub. A gist is basically like a short code snippet you can share out. Um, so it's a nice way to do it that way too. If you don't want to share a whole program, but you just want to share out a code snippet, a gist is a nice way to do that, and that's in GitHub too. Um, so I'm going to make a new repository. So GitHub, or with, so GitHub uses a technology called Git, G-I-T, um, which is a repository technology. There's a couple others out there. Uh, there's Mercurial, which is very, very similar to Git. And then there's also, um, uh, what are they? VCS and C something. I don't know. Those are really old and terrible and don't use them. Um, they, they were really big in the day before Git came along. Um, those, the old ones that they're still used some places and they maybe have their purposes, you might be able to argue. I wouldn't try arguing for that, though, because 
I hate them. Um, but a centralized repository, and let's see if we have a Wikipedia article on this. Uh, Wikipedia. Repository. Uh, buh, 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 buh. Uh, oops, software repository. I just want to list the names of them. That's all I'm looking for. Uh, do, 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 do. No, that's not what I want. That's not what I want. Eh. Centralized software repositories. They're so old, they've been wiped from the internet, basically. <laughs> um, but yeah, CS, or, uh, SVC, is that what it's called? It's been so long. Um, no. Anyways, I can't think of their name. You probably won't come across one since they've been wiped from the internet, apparently. But anyways, the, the old school centralized repositories... Centralized being the key word. Basically, the, the main version of your code lived on one server. It was called the trunk. And um, you would check in and check out code to it. And the annoying thing is when you checked out code, that locked it from anyone else changing it. So, like, if you're working on a team with three people and someone checks out a file, you have to wait until that person checks it back in before either of the other two people can edit it. So it did that to make sure that, like, you know, no one was editing the same file at once, which had its benefits, I guess. Uh, but it was really annoying because, like I just said, if two people are trying to work on the same code, even though they're working in different parts of that file, it's still checked out. They can't both work on it at the same time. So Git and Mercurial are examples of distributed um, repositories. And so a distributed repository is very different. It has... Every single copy of a Git repo or a Mercuro repo is a complete, fully independent copy of it. And then you have remotes that you can push to. So like GitHub is a GitHub's a repository. So I'm going to make a repo real quick. We'll call it uh, beginner, what I call it? Beginner code. Um, sample code from our beginner lessons. Okay, this is just a description to show. And then I can make it public or private. I think if you have a free account, you can't select private. Uh, but anyone can make public for free. And then I'm not going to initialize it with anything. So I'm going to create a repository. <coughs> so this just created a Git repository. It's a fully complete, its own copy of a Git repository. Now what I'm going to do in our code here, I'm going to open up the terminal, the command prompt, command line. I'm going to do git init dot. So Git's a program you install. Uh, if you're on Windows, you, well, just basically Google Git, and I think it's the first link. Uh, yeah, and then go to Downloads, and then you can get it for whichever repo you want, or for whichever operating system you want. Um, so Git is the, thing, the, the name of the program, and then in it is create a repo, and then this dot, just like our dot slash, dot means the current place I am. So I'm saying, Initialize a new repo right where I am, and I'm in our top folder here. Okay, so it made a Git repo. So now I have a I have a fully in, and if I hit refresh here, oh actually I think it hides it now. Yeah, uh, it's not showing it here, but it actually made a dot Git folder. Oh wait, no, it didn't. Oh yeah, there it is. It made a dot Git folder. It's hidden. Uh, you can see it's kind of grayed out. I have C hidden files. Uh, and this is where it keeps info about that Git fold, uh, about my Git repo. So right now, I have a completely separate Git repo. GitHub has a completely separate Git repo. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to add GitHub as a remote to my repo. So a remote, as in like remote server, is a repo on some other computer. So to do that, I'm going to copy our, our repo URL here. I'm going to come here. I'm going to do git remote add origin. So origin is kind of your default remote repo. Um, so like when you make a repo, this is like origin is usually your main place for your code. Although again, they're all fully independent, so it doesn't. It you know it's your 
it's your main, but there's nothing really truly special about it other than it's just the place everyone's going to put your stuff. But they're all still fully independent. So I'm going to add a remote origin. So remote, get remote, add origin, and then I'm going to paste in that URL I copied. So now I've made that a remote copy of my repo. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do, so first I'm going to type git status, and this is just going to show me what files are there that I haven't, that I've changed since the last time I did anything, since I've never done anything with my git repo. They're all new. And then notice this dot idea folder here. This folder is a special folder that IntelliJ uses to keep track of settings for your project. You usually don't want to share that with other people though, because it, it doesn't play nice on other people's computer. It's specific to your computer and your setup. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a new file and it's going to be dot get ignore. The dot before the beginning, all of these things, dot get dot idea and dot get ignore, that's a convention from Linux. On Linux, any file that starts with a dot is basically a hidden file by default. Windows does hidden files differently, so that's not the case here. But you'll do dot get ignore, um, or you'll do a dot and that's kind of your hidden file. So you'll see a lot of special types of files. They'll start with dot when you're working with different things. So the dot get ignore file is a special file that git will check to that I can tell it, hey, don't add or try to get me to add any files that match these patterns in here. So I'm going to come in here and I'm going to dot idea and you don't technically have to add the slash, but I like to add the slash so I know it's a directory, not just a file name. So now that I've added this, I'm telling git, hey, I don't want to add this to my repo ever. Don't even show it to me. As far as you know, git, it doesn't exist. So now if I do get status again, so right now we have dot idea. I'm going to hit get status. Goodbye uh, dot idea. And then we do have a get ignore here now. So, all right. So now that this was, looks good, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do git add dot. And that just says add all of the changes in this directory. So I'm going to add all these. Now if I hit get status, they're all in green. So that means they've been added or staged is what we call that. Um, but they've not, they're not added to my repo yet. They're just ready to be added. So now what I'm going to do is do a commit. So a commit is like, I'm committing. If you, if what happens if you ignore the git ignore, um, if you ignore the git ignore, it will, um, when I go to add, it won't add the git ignore, which would mean I wouldn't push up my git ignore, which means someone else would probably, if someone else pulled down my code, they would probably end up accidentally putting their dot idea. Um, but yeah, but other than that, it would still work. And as, on your computer, the git ignore would still work. So like if you wanted to have a custom git ignore that you never share with others, that's just for your computer, you could actually do that and ignore your own git ignore file and you wouldn't doubt it. Um, yeah, so I have all these staged. They're all ready to be added. So I'm going to do a commit. And a commit is what actually writes like a record into my repo. Um, so I can do dash A here, and that would add everything. Uh, it's almost the same as git add dot, except it won't do new files. It'll only do modified files. Um, probably every time you see me commit on this stream, I'll add dot A, even if I don't need to, just out of force of habit. Um, like right now, because all of my files are staged, I don't need to do that. If I come in here now and I change another file and I do git status, oh, oh I'm gonna change. Actually, will it change? Yeah, there we go. So it's saying, hey, you've made a change since you last staged. So I have to restage this file, this modified file. So that's where like git add hyphen um, would add that file to my commit to. So it's basically doing this in one step. Um, but we don't want to do that. Status. To get status. And there we go. We're all green. So I got my change out of there. Okay. So now we'll commit it. And dash M, you do want to do that every time. So dash M and then a uh, double quote. And then you can put a message here. And this is the message that'll show up whenever you look at all your commits. So you want it to kind of describe what you're doing. So, um, or what you what you did, what changes you made. So in this case, we'll say added, uh, sam added files for um, prime enemy and arrays. 
So, you know, just whatever we did. And then I hit enter. And so you'll see it, it added my files. And then here it does a mode change. You don't have to worry too much about that. But basically it changed the permissions of the file to, to make them shareable, essentially. Um, so now I have them committed. And uh, visuals, I'll show you, there's also lots of visual um, programs to manage Git. Uh, WebStorm, all IntelliJ products have one built in. I actually prefer the command line, so I never use it other than for complicated things. But we can actually come here, hit version control, hit log, and I can actually see this commit here. So this is that message I just typed in. Shows who did it. Shows what branch it's on, which we'll talk about in a second, when I did it. And if I click on a commit, it'll also show me what files were changed. And then I can even, um, if I like have other changes here, I can do um, right click, do show diff. Um, compare with local in this case. And I can see, no, it's not. Oh, is that not? Oh, I have index open. Not that one. Compare with local. I can see what what I changed between them. You can see in green. So green is, and differs slightly in your, um, if you're using a visual, what your visual editor does. But most of them use green for things that were added, red for things that were moved, and, or might be gray actually in here. Um, and then it'll use blue for things that are slightly different, but don't really affect anything. So like spaces and stuff. The spacing's a little different, you'll see blue. Um, so you can see what's different. So that was compare with local. So that's comparing what's in the commit versus what's local. You, if you do, uh, if we had more than one commit, I could do show diff, and that would show what changed between the two commits, but in pretty much the same way, it would show the two. Um, but yeah, so now that I've committed, I need to push my commit, so, um, just to recap, so again, we have two separate servers. We have my, ser my or two separate repos, my repo on my computer, and the GitHub repo in GitHub. Um, so now what I want to do, I added the GitHub repo as a remote. I want to push my code to that repo. So we're going to do git push. And normally, I'll, after you've done one push, all you have to do is git push again, and it'll push again. The first time you do it, you have to set what the upstream branch is. So um, what a branch is, is basically, and let's go, <laughs> um, I'm trying to think what might be a good example to go look at that has branches. Um, do, 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 do. Get up, I don't know, node. We'll go look at the source code for node itself. Um, hope, I suspect they'll have branches. Let's see, not that though. I want uh, commits. Mm, maybe this guy? No. Hmm, do they not? Let me go there directly. Da, 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 branch it. Oh, there, commits. <laughs> um. Mm. No, I don't work it on one branch. Yeah, visualize is a little different here. But so uh, branches basically are kind of copies of the code. And I wish it would let me visualize it a little different here. GitHub only is let me letting me see one at a time. Here, we'll pull it down and we'll look at it in IntelliJ. That'll work. Um, b -b -b clone, clone. I'll explain what cloning is in just a second after we finish pushing. Bash, paste. Hopefully it's not like 800 million files big. It shouldn't be too terrible. So what I'm doing here basically is I'm downloading a cop downloading the git code or the a copy of the repo but because all of my re all repos are full copies I'm cloning it I'm creating like a complete copy of it I'm not just pulling down the files I'm also pulling down all the history about it as well So let's open that guy up 
Uh, ba ba node. New window. Oh, there we go. Okay, so yeah, here's, well, man, that's a very flat repo for being so, huh. Okay, but anyway, so what branches are basically, if, if like, um, you know, someone has their code and they want to do something, that's a bad example. Mm. All right, this was a terrible choice in repo. All their branches are detached. That's weird. This is a weird repo. Um, but anyways, but basically the branch is like I can make a branch and then I can edit the code based on where I created that branch and someone else can have their branch or they can work on the main branch. And then we can do what's called a merge and put those two branches together. Um, and that's where kind of this path is where you have lines that kind of go back into one another. But it's weird because these are completely detached. Normally you wouldn't have them detached. You'd have like this connected here and then they'd read connect here. So this is kind of a weird repo. They, uh, they have an interesting process. Um, but yeah, so, but the branches are, be, again, remember each repo is completely independent of one another. So the branches on my computer don't necessarily exist on the branches on the GitHub repo. So what I'm, what it wants me to do here is set the upstream branch. So it's like, hey, what branch? So I'm on a branch right now called master. That's the default branch on branch master. So it's saying, what, what branch, or what should we call your branch on the remote that we're getting ready to push to? That's what the remote or the upstream branch is. 99.999% of the time, you'll keep the branch names the same thing. And it actually tells you what code you have to run to do that. Uh, the shortcut version of that is git push dash u. So hyphen hyphen set hyphen upstream and dash u are the same thing. They're aliases. Um, and then the second part is which remote. So origin is our remote. Um, and then master. So this is the branch name on the remote server. So git push origin master. And then once I do that once, it remembers what I picked. So if I just type git push again, it's just going to push straight there. Uh, so we can see here, it has a handful of stuff. So this is it crunching up the stuff and sending it. And then um, it actually gave me a link to the remote. And it said I made a new branch. My, this is my master, and I made it master on there. So now if I pop over to the GitHub URL, we can now see all my code here. And we can also see one commit here. Um, and everything. And actually, one thing we didn't do that we you should always do in your project is make a readme.md file. MD stand, uh, you name it by convention, you always name it all uppercase the readme part. And .md stands for markdown, which is just kind of a it's a programmer ish language that or um, syntax. It's not a language; it's a syntax that you can use to to very quickly create like stylized text documents. Um, so here's their their thing. So like if you type this, this is how it shows up in like GitLab and stuff. Um, so headers, blah, blah, blah. Um, but you always want to include one. And what you want to include in the readme uh, are various things. I always include, um, I start with the title. So beginner uh, coder samples from Chris Streaming Code. Give it a title, and then I usually give it a brief description. Uh, these are samples we made during our beginner coder stream, and then um, usually the other thing, the other minimum thing you want to have is how to run it, how to make it go, because every project is different on how you make it go. So in this case, you just open index.html in Chrome. That's it. Um, other programs may have more complicated things. Uh, other things you might put in here, we're not going to, well, actually we will, um, is a license. So uh, every, all software is released under a license. Um, you know, even if you, don't, if you don't have one, the license is basically proprietary, you don't use. Um, we're gonna release this under the MIT license, which is one of the most, um, uh, like, um, What's the word I'm looking for? One of the least restrictive licenses out there. There's a handful of them that are about the same. Uh, but basically, MIT means you can do anything you want with it. I don't care. Um, but I don't make any promises to you. 
about it working or anything like that. Um, so we'll include that. Usually you'll have this in the README or um, you may have a separate license.txt file, which would have this text in here. Um, but yeah, so license is one. And then basically just anything that someone needs to know about your project. If you like kind of hop on uh, GitHub and just kind of browse around. So all of this is coming from their uh, readme file. So they have a lot of stuff in the readme file. And we can go find their readme file and look in, well, this is this is the parse version. If we hit raw version, we can see, oh, they're actually using each, well, they're using a mix. Yeah, so we have like, they have some marked out stuff in here. They also, you can also put HTML in um, GitHub's flavor of Markdown. There are a couple different flavors of it. Um, but yeah, so include README. And then if we push, so now that I've made a change, I'm going to, uh, I'll type git status. You don't have to keep typing git status. I just like to because I like to see the state to make sure it's doing what I think. So we'll do git add dot, do git status only green, good. Git commit dash a dash m added a readme.md and then git push. And like I said, because I already set the upstream once, it remembers it and I don't have to keep typing it. So now that readme is pushed up here and now I can see that readme right here. Um, okay, so now I've pushed up my code. So now if you wanted to pull it down, what you'll do is clone it. So cloning it, once you have not Git installed, um, you would go, uh, where is it? Clone or download. And you can actually, you don't have to have Git. Uh, GitLab actually, or yeah, GitHub lets you download it as a zip file too. So if you want to do it that way, you totally can as well. Um, but I always use Git. So I'm going to copy this, which in GitHub, this button copies it to the clipboard for you. And then at least on, well, on Windows, you're going to right click and you should have, should have a Git bash here thing. And that's going to open up a terminal. Um, on Mac and Linux, you'll just open up a uh, terminal um, program. You know, it's just literally called terminal on those. Um, and then I'm going to do git clone. So again, gets the program, clones the command. And then I just paste the text. And it's going to clone it. And I'm not going to hit enter because I have a folder like this. But oh, wait, actually, they're different. So we will. Um, and it's just going to clone it into a folder with this name here. If I wanted it to go into a different folder, I can do space and put a different folder name and I'll put a different folder there. And so now this has all my code too. So now this is a complete copy of the repo that can be completely standalone. This is one and this is one. And I'm gonna delete two of them because I don't need three copies. Um, and then say, um, say, you know, well, say on Thursday, we'll edit, we'll keep adding to this. So I'll have added new stuff to it. And you want to get that new stuff. What you'll do is you'll go in and you'll do git pull. So just like we push the code out, we're going to pull the code in. So it'll pull all of the stuff from, from the upstream branch, from the branches that match one another. Um, and it'll pull the code back down. So that's how you get updates of the code. So you push code up, pull it back down. Um, and yeah. So yeah, so the code's up there now. Uh, actually, I'm gonna rename the repo real quick. Uh, can I rename the repo? Settings, yes. Rename, beginner coder. Okay, um, so yeah, so if you're interested in grabbing the code, I think I have, do I have a link on my Twitch yet? Uh, yeah, I'm in the process of, I'm working with a, a pretty good, uh, or a really good graphic designer and she's helping me create some graphics and whatnot to make my site nicer. I don't actually, let me edit this real quick. Do, 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 let's add a new thing. Add text, website. Oh, that's what? Uh, Twitch supports Markdown. That's funny, but their flavor is, doesn't support HTML. You can find more about the stream links to projects and social media on our site. 
And then so in uh, Markdown to do a link, you wrap the text you want to show up in curly or uh, square brackets, and then you put the URL right after that in um, um, sorry, I forgot my URL in uh, parentheses. So that's submit, and we'll pretty this up later. Oh, and then unedit, unedit. Uh, there you go. So if you want to get a hold of the code and you don't want to type out the URL from the video, um, go to the website, go to social, GitHub, and you can see all of my GitHub stuff. And this is beginner code. And I'll get it, try to get it onto the projects list as well so you can see it there. Um, but yeah, if you want to connect on, um, you know, I'm on Discord pretty much all the time. Uh, you can hit me up on Twitter. Um, you know, I... Uh, all of the streams I do will end up on YouTube pretty shortly after. Um, so if you missed anything or you want to watch it over again, uh, you can find it on YouTube um, after it disappears from Twitch, which it'll be on Twitch for how long do they leave it? Two weeks. Uh, but it'll be on YouTube forever. And then Instagram, I made this. I don't think I've put anything on there yet, but... If you love Instagram and want to follow me in the hope I might put something on there at some point in the future, uh, feel free. But I probably won't. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, so hopefully you guys enjoyed. So um, the next regularly scheduled stream is Sunday. that will be working on the, the main project, that game I showed you. The next um, stream for uh, this format, the beginner format, um, where we'll pick up from where we are leaving off today will be next Thursday. So every Thursday we'll have one of these for the next, uh, three weeks, four weeks total. Um, thank you for the ice plate. Um, so yeah, so if you want to continue this stream, check it out Thursday and then throughout the week, whenever I have time, if I'm working on side things, I'll stream then. So if you ever catch me online at a random time, you know, I'll be working on something random. So, you know, you might check that out. Might be cool. Might be boring. Hopefully not. Um, but yeah, so thanks for joining me, everyone. Hope you guys enjoyed. Um, you know, if you liked it, follow so you can see when I'm online and yeah, have a great night, everyone.